Hello everyone and welcome to the course. I have created this section as a starter kit to give you some tips on how to approach the course so that you can use it effectively. Please listen to the tips very carefully so that you can get the best out of this course and have a good learning experience. The first thing I would like to talk about is captions. Now, English is my primary language and I speak English at a very steady pace because I am very comfortable with it. However, there might be some words which are not clear to you, especially when English is not your first language. So, I always suggest the students to turn on the captions so that you can see the subtitles. How you can turn on the captions? If you look in the front of your screen, you will see a screenshot. This screenshot is of video player in Udemy. Within this video player, you can see the CC icon which I have highlighted with the yellow color. So, you have to move your cursor to this icon and then select the subtitle language as English. Once you do that, you will start getting subtitles in English. As I speak about the course, the same words will start coming as subtitles within the video player. This will help you to easily understand the course as I am explaining it. In addition to this, you can also use this video player to speed up or slow down the videos based on your comfort level. The next thing which I am going to talk about is how you can download the resources which are templates or source code that are available with the course. Now, if you look at the screenshot in front of you, whenever a resource is available for download, it is indicated by a folder icon on the right hand side of the course player at Udemy. If you are a first time Udemy user, you might face a problem in identifying this folder. But if you are a regular user, you would know where to find it out. For the first time users, I have pasted this screenshot so that it's easy for you to identify it. Now, if you click on the folder icon, the downloadable resources will appear and you can download the file by clicking on the resource title. For example, in the screenshot, there is a resource available for download in the lecture Create Process Metrics. So, after clicking on the folder icon, the resource processmetrics.xls is appearing, which I have highlighted with a dotted red color rectangle. And if you click on this, you can download the resource, which is a template in this case, but can also be a source code file as well for some other lecture. Let's now talk about how to get help if the course material is not clear or if you have some questions around this. For all such cases, please feel free to write down your questions in the Q&A section, the question and answer section. I am quite quick with my responses and usually respond to the questions of students within 24 hours. However, I will also suggest you to take a look at the featured questions section wherein you can view the questions that have been asked by your fellow students before and are already clear with the responses. But if you are not able to find your question there, please add this in the Q&A section. There are two important lectures in the course. Tool setup which explains in detail how to do the setup and create your own code environment and download code which has instructions on how to use the source code files after download. Whenever you get any error during execution of the code, which effectively means that your code is not working during execution, 
please do a review of these lectures to ensure that you are not missing on any important instruction. However, if you are still facing any errors, please write down the complete set of steps on how you arrived at that error and screenshot of the error and post it in the question and answer section. I will get back to you on those cases. Now, when you are learning a new course, it is essential that you assess yourself within the course as you progress through the course material. So, I have added quiz at the end of each section. The quiz evaluation will help you to assess your knowledge on where you stand and also you can find out what are the topics that you have to revisit in the previous lectures. And lastly, if you have any suggestions or inputs that can enhance the course, please share the same in your feedback and do share your learning experience on the course. Thank you for your time. Look forward to talk to you in the next lecture. Thank you. Welcome to the course. In this module, I will start with giving an overview of artificial intelligence and within that, I am going to explain how does computer vision, machine learning and deep learning fits into the overall spectrum of artificial intelligence. Post that, I will explain what is computer vision and why it has become such a buzzword in the industry right now. Towards the end, I will talk about image basics such as pixel, channels and color models that you need to be aware of while working on images within computer vision. So, let's begin. Artificial intelligence can be defined as a research field which deals with how can we build computer systems that can do what people can do. So, it refers to systems or machines that mimic human intelligence to perform tasks and can iteratively improve themselves based on the information they collect. Artificial intelligence comprises of many disciplines such as computer vision, machine learning, natural language processing, speech recognition and robotics. But broadly we can classify it into two main categories. Computer vision which teaches machines to see and comprehend what they see and machine learning which teaches machines to learn with text and speech. Coming to deep learning, it is defined as a class of algorithms that uses multiple layers to progressively extract high-level features from the raw input. So, in deep learning, we have neural networks, which are basically algorithms inspired from the human brain that learn from a large amount of data. Now, if you look at the diagram on the screen, then artificial intelligence is a broad set within which we have computer vision and machine learning and deep learning as well, which is a subset of machine learning that falls in the intersection between computer vision and machine learning. So, that's how deep learning fits within the artificial intelligence spectrum. If we see the recent years, Artificial intelligence has seen an explosive growth and it is evolving rapidly across the dimensions of compute, data and algorithm. More and more businesses are keen to adopt artificial intelligence or AI solutions as it has brought in a major transformation by achieving faster computation and high accuracy. If I talk about few of the key areas, that AI has manifested itself, then that would be personalized user experience, automated customer service, increased customer leads by using targeted ads, and enhanced surveillance to name a few of them. Computer vision enables machines to see, identify, and process images like humans. On a high level, it is defined as the automated extraction of information from images which can be anything from your 3D models, camera position, object detection and recognition to
do grouping and searching image content but everywhere the key objective is that a computer understand and label what is present in an image in the recent years computer vision has been successful to solve problems around optical character recognition that is ocr machine inspection 3d model building medical imaging motion capture to cite a few of the areas broadly speaking computer vision tasks include methods for acquiring processing analyzing and understanding digital images as well as extraction of high dimensional data from the real world in order to produce numerical or symbolic information in the form of decisions so what are the tasks that you will encounter in most of the computer vision applications let's take a look at the diagram on the screen when we talk about object recognition that is recognizing an object it first involves object or image classification so in this image i am classifying in the first case that image is of a cat same way i can classify my image as dog and image as rabbit as well and then we have localization along with classification that is where we are locating the object in a image after this we have object detection which detects the object in an image and finally segmentation that finds out what pixels belong to the object in the image or i can say finding the boundaries of my object In this lecture I will be covering the basics around images that you need to be aware of before we start working on reading an image and performing some processing on it. A computer represents image data in the form of a pixel or picture element which can be defined as the smallest unit of information that makes up a picture. If you look at any photograph in a digital format it is actually made up of pixels or we can say pixels are the basic building block of a digital image these pixels are usually represented using dots or squares and are arranged in a two dimensional grid on a high level the images can be categorized as black white and color within black and white if we talk about binary images then it can take only two values 0 or 1 and it is called as one bit images whereas when we talk about gray scale then that image contains gray level information and no color information the gray scale image contains 8 bit data wherein each pixel has only a single value representing the light value with 0 being black and 255 being white on the other hand the color pixels have three values representing red green and blue channels so we can say that a pixel consists of three channels namely red blue and green wherein each channel will have intensity values in fact each pixel coordinate say xy contains three values where each number is an 8 bit number which has the values between the range of 0 to 255 so if we have all three values at full intensity that's red blue and green all are at 255 then it shows up as white and if all three have the value 0 then it shows up as black so if we mix the different intensity of each color it gives us the full color spectrum let's now spend time to learn about color models a color model is a system for creating a full range of colors using the primary colors there are two different color models additive and subtractive additive models use light to represent colors in computer screens while subtractive models use inks to print those digital images on papers now if you look at the diagram on the screen there are three major color space models rgb hsv and lab each having different set of properties among these hsv and lab are alternative representation of rgb model and are closely aligned with the way human vision perceives color 
RGB color space is an additive color space wherein colors are obtained by a linear combination of red, green and blue values. These three channels are correlated by the amount of light hitting the surface. When we move on to LED color space, then it has three components. L for lightness or intensity. A signifies the color component. As you can see on the screen, it ranges from green to red. And B stands for color component ranging from blue to yellow. Now, when we compare the LAB with RGB color space, they are quite different. In RGB color space, the color information is separated into three channels, but the same three channels also encode brightness information. On the other hand, in LAB color space, the L channel is independent of color information and encodes brightness only, while the other two channels encode color. So, in the LAB color model, we can say that L is the lightness on a scale from 0, which is black, to 100, which is white which in fact is a grayscale image. A is a color component ranging from green to red and blue is a color component ranging from blue to yellow. The next color space is HSV, which has three main components. H is for the hue, that is my dominant wavelength. S is for saturation. V is for value or intensity. Now, here in HSV uses only one channel to describe color, which is H. So, this makes it very intuitive to specify color. It attempts to depict the colors as perceived by the human eye, wherein hue value varies in the range of 0 to 179, saturation value varies from 0 to 255, and the value or the intensity varies from 0 to 255. This color space model is mostly used for the color segmentation purpose. So, with this, we have finished the image basics. Welcome back. In this module, we will start with the basic building block of deep learning and that is neuron and then move on to understand the architecture of neuron. Post this, we will go deep into the architecture of artificial neural network that is ANN and then move on to learn Convolutional Neural Network, also known as CNN. Towards the end, we will understand the role of activation function within a neural network. A neuron is the powering unit of a neural network and can be defined as a computational unit which gets a number of inputs through its input wires, does some computation and then sends its output to other nodes or neurons. This neuron is modeled based on the neurons in our brain. As we all know, our brain is made up of lot of neurons wherein each neuron has number of input wires called as dendrites which receive inputs from other locations. Also, neuron has output wires called as axons which it uses to send signals or messages to other neurons. When a neuron wants to communicate with other neuron, it sends a little pulse of electricity through an axon to the other neuron which accepts the message, does some computation and may send out other messages through its axon to other neurons. This is the basis of a neuron and that is how all the senses and muscles in our body work. The neuron also sometimes called as perceptron has a similar structure when we talk about deep learning. In fact, a neuron has the ability to learn and solve complex problems if we provide it with enough training data and computing power. Now, if you look at the architecture diagram of a neuron on the screen, we can visualize that a neuron within a neural network is a logistic unit to which we feed a few inputs through input wires. So, like in this case, the inputs are x1, x2, x3, x4 and x5. It does some computation and then outputs some value on the output wire. Like in this case, the output is coming as y here. A neuron is modeled based on the neuron of human brain with the intent to solve a complex problem. 
on a high level a neuron can be defined on a high level a neuron can be defined as a simple learning machine that can take few inputs each of which has a weight to signify how important it is and then generate an output decision of 0 or 1 and when it is combined with other neurons it forms an artificial neural network if you look at the diagram on the screen the neuron takes real values as its inputs for example if a neuron is tasked with classifying iris flowers which is an open deep learning data set then the two inputs could be the length and width of the flower petals then we have weights which represent the relative importance of each of the weights to the classification decision please remember that a bias weight is added and multiplied by the constant equal to 1 so with this computation we get weighted sum wherein input values are multiplied by the weights and summed up to create one aggregated value which is then fed into an activation function as we can see here this activation function then generates a classification decision as an output artificial neural network is a very effective study art technique for modern day machine learning applications they are defined as statistical learning algorithms that are inspired by the properties of biological neural networks they are used for a wide variety of tasks from relatively simple classification problems to speech recognition and also computer vision artificial neural networks or ann is a supervised learning system built of a large number of simple elements called as neuron or perceptron each neuron can make simple decision and feeds those decisions to other neurons organized in a interconnected layer together the neural network can emulate almost any function and answer practically any question given enough training samples and computing power from a structure perspective a simple neural network has following components an input layer that accepts the independent variables or inputs of the model here input will be the source data fed into the neural network with the goal of making a decision or prediction about the data it also has one or more hidden layer wherein artificial neurons take in a set of weighted inputs and produce an output through an activation function also it has an output layer that generates the predictions now if you look at the diagram on the screen this is the architecture of a artificial neural network here you can see each node in the network takes many inputs from other nodes and calculate a single output based on the inputs and the connection weights this output is generally fed into another neuron repeating the whole process so with this you can envision the internal structure of a artificial neural network where neurons are organized into different layers artificial neural network or anns are implemented as a system of interconnected processing elements called as nodes which are functionally analogous to biological neurons each neuron is given a numeric weight the weights together with activation function define each neuron's output neural networks are trained by fine tuning weights to discover the optimal set of weights that can generate the most accurate prediction artificial neural network or ann is quite robust with respect to handling noise in training data but there is a lot of hardware dependence as ann requires processors with parallel processing power by their structure also it can take a long time to train a artificial neural network a convolutional neural network or cnn is a class of deep neural networks that can recognize and classify particular features from images and is widely used for analyzing images it functions by taking in an input image assign importance that is learnable weights and biases to various aspects objects in the image so that it is able to differentiate one from the another 
Now, if you look at the architecture diagram of convolutional neural network on the screen, we can see it has multiple layers that help in extracting information from an image. Let's spend some time to understand the various layers of convolutional neural network or CNN. The first layer is a convolutional layer which is the core building block of a convolutional neural network and is used to extract the various features from the input image. Herein, the mathematical operation of convolution is performed between the input image and a filter. The output is termed as the feature map which gives us the information about the image such as the corners and edges. Later on, this feature map is fed to the other layers of the convolutional neural network to learn several other features of the input image. In the diagram, if you see, a convolutional layer is scanning a source image with a filter of 5 by 5 pixels to extract features which may be important for classification. This filter is also called as the convolutional kernel. The kernel also contains weights which are tuned in in the training of the model to achieve the most accurate predictions. In a 5x5 kernel, for each 5x5 pixel region, the model computes the dot products between the image pixel values and the weights defined in the filter. When we talk about 2D convolution layers, it takes a 3-dimensional input Typically, an image with three color channels, they pass a filter, also called a convolution kernel over the image, inspecting a small window of pixels at a time, for example, 3 by 3 or 5 by 5 pixels in size and moving the window until they have scanned the entire image. The convolution operation calculates the dot product of the pixel values in the current filter window with the weights defined in the filter. The next layer of CNN is pooling layer that downsamples each feature to reduce its dimensionality and focus on the most important elements. This downsampling is done by using various pooling operations such as max pooling wherein the largest element is taken from the feature map, average pooling where the average of the elements in a predefined sized image section is calculated. Some pooling, wherein the total sum of the elements in the predefined section is computed. So once the convolution ends, the features are downsampled and then the same convolution structure repeats again. Next, we have fully connected layer, also known as FC that flattens the features identified in the previous layers into a vector and predicts probabilities that the image belongs to each one of several possible labels. After understanding the architecture of convolution neural network or CNN, let's now understand why it is the preferred approach for image classification. The CNN approach for image classification is based on the idea that the model function properly based on a local understanding of the image. It uses fewer parameters compared to a fully connected network by reusing the same parameter numerous times. While a fully connected network generates weights from each pixel on the image, a convolutional neural network or CNN generates just enough weights to scan a small area of the image at any given point of time. This approach is beneficial for the training process because the fewer parameters within the network, the better it performs. Additionally, since the model requires less amount of data, it is also able to train faster. When a CNN model is trained to classify an image, it searches for the features at their base level. For example, while a human might identify an elephant by its large ears or trunk, a computer will scan for the curvatures of the boundaries of these features and perhaps that's the reason there are many applications for image classification with deep neural networks. CNN has multiple use cases in the industry right now. It can be embedded in the systems of autonomous cars to help the system recognize the surrounding of the car 
and classify objects to distinguish between ones that do not require any action such as trees on the sides of a road and ones that do such as civilians crossing the street another use case for cnn is in advertising for example cnn can easily scan a person's facebook page classify fashion related images and detect the person's preferred style allowing marketers to offer more relevant clothing advertisements so cnn is very popular in the industry because of its various advantages with this we have finished the convolutional neural network activation functions are a crucial component of deep learning they determine the output of a deep learning model its accuracy and also the computational efficiency of training a model which can actually make or break a large scale neural network from a technical perspective activation functions are mathematical equations that determine the output of a neural network within this the function is attached to each neuron in the network and determine whether it should be activated or not based on whether each neuron's input is relevant for the model's prediction activation functions also help normalize the output of each neuron to a range between 1 and 0 or between minus 1 and 1 if you look at the diagram on the screen we can see that the activation function is a mathematical gate in between the input feeding the current neuron and its output going to the next layer it can be as simple as a step function that turns a neuron output on and off depending on a rule or threshold or it can be a transformation that maps the input signals into output signals that are needed for a neural network to function with an activation function there are three main types firstly we have binary step function which is a threshold based activation function If the input value is above or below a certain threshold the neuron is activated and sends exactly the same signal to the next layer The limitation with this function is that it doesn't allow multi value outputs for example it can't support classifying the inputs into various categories Then we have linear activation function that takes the inputs multiplied by the weights for each neuron and creates an output signal proportional to the input it is better than the binary step function because it allows multiple outputs not just yes or no after that we have non linear activation function which are used by modern neural network models they allow the model to create complex mappings between the network's inputs and outputs which are essential for learning and modeling complex data such as images video audio and data sets which are non linear or have high dimensionality welcome back the focus area of this module is to take you through a step by step process for tool setup that we need to do to work on the various projects in this course to start with i will first cover the tool setup for ubuntu then i am going to cover the setup for windows environment after that i am going to give you a walk through of pycharm and explain how it can be used for coding and then i will cover how you can use jupyter notebook along with some useful shortcuts finally we are going to learn how to use google colab for training your model I will now explain the tool setup for Ubuntu environment. As a first step, you have to open terminal in your Ubuntu system and download Python 3.6 using command given on the screen. Python 3.6 is currently the most stable version, but if you are confident of some other Python version which you think is stable and compatible enough, then you can use the same also. But if you are doing that make sure that you might have to update code or packages accordingly once that has been done go to ubuntu software and search for pycharm there and install it one very important thing please use the same syntax of commands as you see on the screen to avoid getting any errors also for your reference i have added the setup manual for ubuntu environment in the resources section that can be used as a reference document 
while you are getting your environment ready. With this, we have finished the setup of all required tools and libraries for our Ubuntu system. I will now explain the tool setup for Windows environment. As a first step, we will install Python. I have shared the website link from where you can install Python on your Windows machine. I recommend version 3.6 because it's a stable version and please install this in the C folder. We are now going to move on to install PyCharm. Now, I have shared the website link from which you can install PyCharm on your Windows machine. Please use these links properly and install these two softwares on your machine. Also for your reference, I have added the setup manual for Windows environment in the resources section. With this, we have finished the setup of all required tools and libraries on the Windows machine. PyCharm is a leading integrated development environment or IDE for Python developers and is widely used in the industry. In this video, I am going to give you a walkthrough on how you can use PyCharm for coding. Once you have installed PyCharm, you have to go to the command prompt. And then simply type PyCharm here. Click on enter. And this is going to launch the PyCharm for you. Once PyCharm has been launched, if you want to create a new project, you have to go to the file menu and click on new project. Within this, you can specify any name you want to give for your project and click on create. This is going to create a new project for you. But if you want to work on an existing project, again go back to file menu and click on open. Here you can specify which project you want to work on. You can select from here and click on OK. I have already created a demo project, so let me just open that now. I am opening it in a new window. Once you open the project, so here you can see on the left nav, this is a project and this is my all the project files. Before starting to work on any project, there are few configurations that you have to take care of. One of the first thing that you have to do is go to the file menu, click on settings. Within that, select your project like my project is project demo. Go to Python interpreter and you have to make sure that Python 3.6 is your interpreter. Now, in case this is not coming up, which means that your environment is not set up properly. So what you can do, you can click on show all and then you have to click on this plus sign. Then you can specify a new environment name. Like in my case, I have put up VENV. -E you can put up any name and then click on OK. So this is going to create a new virtual environment for your project with default pip and setup packages. Let me just cancel this. Also, in case you want to install any package, suppose I want to install a PyPDF4 package which is not there because by default only pip and setup package come. What I can do? I can simply click on this plus icon and then I can type the name of my package. So we can see I have typed PyPDF4 and I can simply click on now install package and my package would be installed. So any package you want to install, you can simply go to the package screen and install from there. And there is another way. You can also create a requirements.txt file and install that if you want to install a set of packages. Also, if you want to check whether all the packages are there or not for my project, you have to again go back to file, settings and here you will see the list of all the packages which are available. So you can always validate the packages here.
One very important thing to note here is that if you want to execute the code via command line and keep packages separate for individual projects, then you can make use of virtual environment. But if you want to install packages for global usage, that is for all the projects, then you can ignore the virtual environment creation for which the steps I have shown you and you can actually install packages without activation as well. Now, I have already created a Python project here. There is some basic Python code in this where I am printing hi and the name here. So, how do you run a Python code? Now, there are two options to run the code. You can go to the run menu and select on run main from here which is going to execute the code. Or you can simply do a right click and click on run main. Let me just execute the code now. So we can see hi PyCharm has been printed here. There is one more option to run the code and for that you can simply click on here this icon and you can run the code. So this is about the normal execution. Let me now show you the debug mode as well. So if I want to debug my code, I can put a breakpoint. So let me put a breakpoint on this print statement here and then I can execute my code in debug mode by either going to run menu and selecting debug main from here or I can simply click on this icon as well and just click on this to start my debug code. Now we can see my program has been suspended at my breakpoint so I can define variables here and watch the values to debug any error. If I want to go forward, I can click on F8. Let me just do that. And if I want to exit, then I can simply press F9. So this way you can use the debug mode. So with this, we have now developed an understanding of PyCharm and we have got all the necessary information that you need to work on the projects in PyCharm. I have created this video to share the code download instructions with you. So you have to go to the resources section of this lecture and from there you can download the Jupyter Notebook. As you know that we have already installed Jupyter Notebook as a part of tool setup so it will be available on your machines. Just go to that path in the command prompt and then you have to type Jupyter Notebook. Let me just show you. So as you can see here. I have gone to that path and I have just simply typed Jupyter Notebook and I will just press enter. This is going to launch the Jupyter Notebook for me. So, once the Jupyter Notebook has been launched, you can select any block of code. Like if I want to execute this block of code, I will just select this and I can simply click on run to execute this code. One more shortcut is that you can also press shift plus enter to run the code. Apart from this, there are a lot of useful shortcuts available in Jupyter Notebook. So if you want to use any of those shortcuts, here is what you can do. You can simply press escape plus H. So all the keyboard shortcuts available in Jupyter Notebook are visible once you press these shortcut keys. So you can use these shortcuts to browse around the code. Welcome back. In this lecture, I am going to explain how you can use Google Colab for creating a new notebook, uploading a notebook, uploading your code or running an existing notebook. As a first step, you have to open a browser of your choice and then go to colab.research.google.com. You can see the URL here. Now, once you type this URL into the browser and then sign in using your Google account, this is the first page you are going to see once your login has been successful. Once you have reached the home page of Google Colab, what's the next step? You can go to the file menu here and then click on new notebook. Once you do that, the Google Colab is going to create a new notebook for you which actually means it's creating a new runtime instance for you. Now, once you reach here, you will see this untitled here. You can just rename the notebook. 
So my notebook has been saved as demo.ipynv file. You can give it any name based on your requirement. So if you go to the file menu, then you can see various options. You can create a new notebook, which we have just done by creating the demo notebook. You can also open a notebook. So if you click on open notebook, it is going to show you the various notebooks available and you can select any of them and open this. Let me just cancel this. And also you can upload a notebook as well. So you can upload your local notebook to Colab by clicking on this button. And there it's going to give you an option where you can choose the file which you want to upload and click on the upload button. Now let's go back to the demo notebook again. Now within this, if you see this, this is my cell execution block where we type the code. If you want to execute the code in the cell, you can either click on this arrow or you can simply press Ctrl plus Enter. The variable declared in one cell can be used in the other cells as a global variable. The environment automatically prints the value of the variable in the last line of the code block if stated explicitly. In addition to this, Google Colab offers us various runtime options. To access them, you have to go to Runtime in the toolbar and then click on Change Runtime Type. Within this, you are going to see various options. By default, it's set to None, which is actually your CPU. Then we have GPU and TPU. Let's understand each one of them now. The CPU runtime is best for training large models because of the high memory it provides. Then we have the GPU. The GPU runtime shows better flexibility and programmability for irregular computations such as small batches computation. Then we have TPU, which is highly optimized for large batches and CNN and has the highest training throughput. If you have a smaller model to train, I suggest training the model on GPU or TPU runtime to use Colab to its full potential. Please note that the free version of Google Colab does not guarantee a sustained availability of GPU or TPU enabled runtime. It is quite possible that your session will be terminated if you use it for too long. Google Colab gives us 12 hours of continuous execution time. After that, the whole virtual machine is cleared and we have to start again. We can run multiple CPUs, GPU and TPU instances simultaneously, but our resources are shared between these instances. Google Colab also allows you to import data from your Google Drive account so that you can access training data from Google Drive and use large data sets for training. Now, there are two ways to mount a drive in Colab. You can either use GUI, or you can use code snippet. I will first explain how to mount a drive in Google Colab using GUI. For that, you have to click on the files icon on the left side of the screen and then you have to click on open notebook. This is going to display me option of Google Drive. So you have to go here and here you can open your notebook if you have already uploaded this to the drive.google.com. So like this is my modules and packages. I can just click on this and my notebook would be opened. As you can see here. The next option is to use the code snippet. Now, if you want to mount a drive in Google Colab using code, then you have to write the code for that. Let me just show you what kind of code you require for that. Now here I have written two lines of code that is going to help me to mount the drive in Google Colab. So if I run this, 
so this will point to a link which says go to this url in a browser now once i click on this link then i have to choose my account my google account which has the google drive data let me just do that So here I have selected the account which has the data. Then in this next window, it's asking me to sign in. So I am doing the sign in. After that, there will be a alphanumeric code coming on the screen here. So I have to copy this code by using this icon. So I will copy the code and then paste it back to the previous screen. So I will just paste it here. Once I have pasted my code, I am going to press the enter key on the keyboard to complete the authentication. So, it has mounted the drive for me. So, this way you can mount your Google Drive on Colab using the two lines of code which I have shown you here. The best method to fully utilize Google Colab is to upload all your code and content that you want to use during execution in Google Drive and then later mount the drive in Colab. This helps in easier execution of code and maintains backup in case of disconnection from Colab servers. I am now going to explain you how you can copy data from Google Drive post mounting. So just click on this plus icon to add a new code and then you can type this command there. So I have a test.py file which I want to copy from Google Drive post mounting. So I'm just going to run this command now. And my file has been copied. So if I show you in the folder structure, you can see test.py has been added here. Next, we are going to learn the command that you can use to copy data to Google Drive. Now for that, again, let's write some code for this. So I have some data which I wanted to copy to Google Drive. So I can just simply run the command which I have written on the screen. Let's just run this. And my data has been copied. Let me now show you the data also. So if I go to the Google Drive. So right now I am in my Google Drive. So you can see within the Colab data folder, my test.py file has been added. So using this way, you can actually copy data to the Google Drive. One very important thing, you can use the code cell in the Colab not only to run the Python code, but also to run some shell commands. For that, you just have to add explanation mark before a command. The exclamation point tells the notebook cell to run the following command as a shell command. If you want to run a different Python library, you can always install it inside your Colab notebook. Let me show you how you can do that. Again, let's add a code. If I run this, with this command, I am actually installing my packages within the notebook. So you can give the name of any package and you can install it within the notebook itself. Also, let me show you one more thing. Suppose you want to see what is your current present working directory. So I've just simply used a pwd command. And if you run this, it will show you I am in this directory right now. So this way you can use various kind of commands to work within the Google notebook. 
with this we have finished the lecture on google colab you can download this notebook from the resources section for your practice welcome back in this module we are going to first go through the basics of object detection models and then move on to understand the architecture of object detection then we will understand how does object detection differ from object tracking and go through various object detection models within that we will start with our cnn model first wherein i am going to explain its architecture and also the challenges around it and then i will move on to explain the architecture of fast r cnn model along with its performance post that we will look at region proposal network or rpn which is an algorithm that you need to understand for next series of models then i'll be covering faster r cnn model and finally close by discussing the r fcn model object detection is a technology related to computer vision and image processing that deals with identifying the presence of predefined types of objects in an image there are various object detection models in industry right now and they can be broadly classified into two categories early models and advanced models the early models comprises of har cascade and hawk models while the advanced category has r cnn fast r cnn faster r cnn ssd yolo and many such models why do we need to use object detection models well the aim of object detection model is to localize the objects present in an image and at the same time classify them into different categories Let's now spend some time to understand what are the key attributes of these models that differentiates them from one another. The first one is computing power or speed. The early models like Har Cascade and Hog require less computation, so we need less computing power for those models and also they have a higher execution speed if we compare them with the advanced models. In fact, due to this reason they are also called as lightweight models next comes data set early models work fine with smaller data set while for advanced models we need to have a substantial data set with us the last attribute is accuracy the advanced set of models are less likely to result in false detections duplicate detections or inconsistent detection boundaries so from a accuracy perspective they are quite better than the early models but that comes with a cost also because advanced models will definitely provide you greater accuracy of results but that is at the cost of more computations so if you have a budget to invest in gpu computing then they are a good choice but the implementation of advanced models can become complex sometimes especially in the real time implementation from an architecture perspective object detection models are usually categorized as one stage and two stage models so what do we understand by that a one stage model is capable of detecting objects without the need for a preliminary step so if we are making a fixed number of predictions on grid then it is called as a one stage model so here in one stage model does both region proposal as well as object classification using one network only retina net and yolo are examples of one stage object detection model on the other hand a two stage detector uses a preliminary stage where regions of importance are detected and then classified to see if an object has been detected in these areas so if we leverage a proposal network to find objects and then use a second network to find you these proposals and output a final prediction then those models are called as two stage models few examples are rcnn faster rcnn and fpn now in these models in the first stage the region proposal network 
narrows down the number of candidate object locations to a smaller number and at the second stage classification is performed for each candidate object location. Object detection often gets mixed up with object tracking but these are two different terms. Let's understand the difference. When we talk about object detection, we are detecting an object in a frame by putting a boundary box around it and classifying the object. Now, the job of object detector ends here and each frame is being processed independently and we can identify numerous objects in a particular frame. While, when we talk about object tracking, we are tracking a particular object across the entire video. How is it done? The object tracking algorithm assigns an ID to each object identified in the image and in the subsequent frame tries to carry across this ID and identify the new position for the same object. For example, if there are three bikes in a frame, the object tracker has to identify the three separate detections and needs to track it across the subsequent frames with the help of a unique ID. Let's look at some more differences between object detection and object tracking. Object detection can occur on still photos while object tracking needs a video feed. Object detection can be used as object tracking if we run object detection on every frame per second. Object tracking need not identify the objects. Objects can be tracked solely on the motion features without knowing the actual objects being tracked. Thus, pure object tracking can be extremely efficient if it leverages the temporal relationship between the video frames. Running object detection as tracking can be computationally expensive and it can only track the known object. Object detection requires a form of classification and localization, while for object tracking, classification can be unnecessary, but that depends on the problem at hand. So it is more of a scenario based. Our CNN or region based convolution model is a deep learning model used in computer vision and object detection. This model uses selective search method to detect region proposals wherein selective search is a region proposal algorithm used for object localization that is going to group the regions together based on their pixel intensities. So it groups pixels based on the hierarchical grouping of similar pixels. If you look at the architecture diagram of our CNN model on the screen, you will see that we are first going to feed the input image and from that we extract 2000 region proposals. That is, 2000 region proposals are generated and once the region proposals have been detected, then each region proposal feeds a convolutional network to extract a feature vector. The convolutional neural network acts as a feature extractor and the output dense layer consists of the features extracted from the image and then those extracted features are fed into a support vector machine or SVM for classification to classify the presence of the object within that candidate region proposal. The algorithm also predicts four values as you can see in the diagram which are offset values to increase the precision of the bounding box using linear regression. If we talk about the challenges of our CNN model, then the only challenge with this model is that it takes huge amount of time to train the networks as you would have to classify 2000 region proposals for each image. Moreover, selective search algorithm is a fixed algorithm so no learning is happening to improve the accuracy and also you have to save the feature map of each region proposal so you need lot of memory. Thus it is not one of the best models for real time implementation in case of object detection. Fast RCNN model or fast region based convolutional neural network model 
was designed with the intent of reducing the time consumption which was a challenge with our CNN model. Within this, instead of extracting CNN features independently for each region of interest, fast our CNN aggregates them into a single forward pass over the image that is, region of interest from the same image share computation and memory in the forward and backward passes. If we look at the architecture diagram of fast RCNN model on the screen, then as a first step, we process the image with CNN, that is, the input image is fed into CNN network to generate a convolutional feature map as an output. From the convolutional feature map, we identify the region of proposals and wrap them into squares and then by using a ROI pooling layer, we reshape them into a fixed size so that it can be fed into a fully connected layer. From the ROI feature vector, we use a softmax layer to protect the class of the proposed region and bounding box regression to find the offset values for the bounding box. With respect to performance, fast RCNN model gives a better accuracy and is significantly faster as well compared to RCNN. But still this algorithm is slowed down due to region proposals and that's why it's not able to give very impressive performance. Region Proposal Network or RPN is a fully convolutional network that simultaneously predicts object bounds and objectness scores at each position. The objectness score here is defined to measure how well the detector identifies the locations and classes of objects during navigation. On a high level, a region proposal network or RPN is a small neural network sliding on the last feature map of the convolution layers and predict whether there is an object or not and also predict the bounding box of those objects. Let's now spend time to understand the architecture. If you look at the diagram on the screen, in the first step, image is resized such that the shortest side is 600 pixels with the longest side not exceeding 1000 pixels. And then this input image is fed into the backbone convolutional neural network, which results in an output feature map. For every point in the output feature map, the network has to learn whether an object is present in the input image at its corresponding location and estimate its size. This is done by placing a set of anchors on the input image for each location on the output feature map from the backbone network. These anchors indicate possible objects in various sizes and aspect ratios at this location. As the network moves through each pixel in the output feature map, it has to check whether these corresponding anchors spanning the input image actually contain objects and then refine these anchors coordinates to give bounding boxes as object proposals or regions of interest. Coming back to the diagram again, as you can see, first a 3x3 three three convolution with 5 1 2 channels all units is applied to the backbone feature map to give a 5 1 2 dimension feature map for every location. This is followed by two sibling layers, a 1 by 1 convolution layer with 18 channels as you can see in the diagram. This is for object classification and then we have a 1 by 1 convolution with 36 units for bounding box regression. The 18 units in the classification branch gives an output of size HW18. This output is used to give probabilities of whether or not each point in the backbone feature map of size H by W contains an object within all 9 of the anchors at that point. The 36 channel in the regression branch gives an output of the size HW36. This output is used to give the four regression coefficients of each of the nine anchors 
for every point in the backbone feature map of size h by w. These regression coefficients are then used to improve the coordinates of the anchors that contain the objects. Faster RCNN model is a combination of region proposal network that is RPN which is a region proposal algorithm and fast RCNN which acts as a detector network. In the earlier models like RCNN and fast RCNN there was slowness due to region proposals. So instead of using selective search algorithm on the feature map to identify the region proposals, the algorithm lets the network learn the region proposals. This is done through region proposal network to directly generate region proposals uses a pre-trained model for classification, predict boundary boxes and then detect the objects. To understand this functioning better, Let's now look at the architecture diagram of faster RCNN model on the screen. In the first step, the input image is passed through the backbone CNN to get the feature map. RPN is a small neural network sliding on the last feature map of the convolution layer and predict whether there is an object or not and also predict the bounding box of those objects. Next, the bounding box proposals from the RPN are used to pull features from the backbone feature map. This is done by the ROI pooling layer which functions by taking the region corresponding to a proposal from the backbone feature map then dividing this region into a fixed number of sub windows and finally performing max pooling over these sub windows to give a fixed size output also called as feature vector. This extracted feature vector are then classified. So as we can see in the diagram, the output from the ROI pooling layer is passed through two fully connected layers and then the features are fed into the sibling classification and regression branches. The classification branch gives the classification scores that is the probability of a proposal belonging to each class and the regression layer coefficients are used to improve the predicted bounding boxes. With respect to implementation, faster RCNN is much faster than the earlier models. So it is also used for real-time object detection. As the name suggests, RFCN or region-based fully convolutional network is a type of region-based object detector which is fully convolutional with almost all computation shared on the entire image rather than having a costly per region SEP network multiple number of times. In this model, the input image feeds a ResNet model to produce feature maps. This model detects region of interest and computes a score for each region. In this model, Feature maps are called as position sensitive score maps because they take into account the spatial localization of a particular object. If we look at the architecture diagram of RFCN model on the screen, then as a first step, the input image is fed into the pre-trained classification network where we use ResNet 101 network and get feature map as an output. Then we extract candidate regions by the region proposal network or RPN which is a fully convolutional architecture in itself. Now, given the proposal regions that is ROIs, the RFCN architecture is designed to classify the ROI into object categories and background. Also, all learnable weight layers are convolutional and are computed on the entire image. RFCN ends with a position sensitive ROI pooling layer. This layer aggregates the outputs of the last convolution layer and generates scores for each ROI. With respect to performance, the performance of RFCN is 2 to 2.5 times better than the faster RCNN model. Welcome back. The objective of this module is to explain the project 
object detection using faster RCNN. I am going to start with project overview wherein I am going to explain the high level design of the project and then proceed to code walkthrough where I am going to explain in detail the source code for this project with instructions on how to execute the code. Finally, I will provide you with the code download instruction so that you can run the project yourself. Welcome to our first project where we are going to do object detection using faster RCNN. In this project, I am using the use case wherein I am going to detect 88 different object types in a recorded video of a marketplace. Having said that, you can use this source code for other use cases of object detection as well such as visual listing of brands, pedestrian detection, etc. In this project, I am going to detect various types of objects in a recorded video. Now, from a technical perspective, faster RCNN, as we have learned earlier, is composed of two main components. A fully convolutional regional proposal network, also called as RPN, for proposing candidate regions, followed by a downstream fast RCNN classifier. Now, for this project, I am going to use PyCharm for the code walkthrough which we have already installed as a part of tool setup. Post code walkthrough, code download instructions will be explained so that you can easily understand how to execute the project. Welcome to the code walkthrough session of object detection using faster RCNN. I will start with showing you the project structure code dependencies and explain how you have to execute the project. As a first step, you have to open PyCharm. For doing that, you have to go to your command prompt and write PyCharm there. Once PyCharm has been opened, you need to browse to the projects and from there go to the project files if it's already not selected. So, on the screen you can see I have already opened PyCharm and I have opened the project faster RCNN here. Next thing is, you have to go to the file menu, settings. Now within settings, go to the project and click on Python interpreter. After that, you have to go to this drop down here and then click here and select show all. Within this, we will have to create a new environment. So click on the plus icon. And then you have to specify a name for the environment. Like in this case, I have specified VENV. You can put any other name also and simply click on OK. So with this, it's going to create a virtual environment for us. So as we can see here, environment has been created. Now this environment comes with the default pip and setup packages, but we have to install the other packages and for that we have to run the requirements.txt file. How you have to do it, I will show you now. From here, just click on OK. Click on apply. and click on OK here. Now you have to open the main python file here. So just click on this faster rcnn object detection dot py file. Now once the file has been opened, click on install requirements and click on install here. This is going to install the other required packages that we need to have to run this project. So we have run requirements.txt and all the packages required for the project have been installed. Now, sometimes it might happen that due to some version mismatch, your requirements.txt failed to run. In that case, what you can do, you can simply open requirements.txt file. Here you will see the name of the packages. 
Now go to terminal and here you have to type pip install and the name of the package which you can copy from here. And just execute this command and repeat the same command for OpenCV Python package as well. This will make sure that all the packages would be correctly installed. But you have to do this only in case your requirement.txt does not execute and gives you any error. Coming back to the source code, in this project we are using pre-trained model of faster RCNN that has been provided in the project with the name of frozen inference graph.pb as you can see on the screen. Once we have defined this, we are initiating this model for object detection on all frames of the input video. Now in the source code, at the start we are importing various libraries. Let's take a look. So the libraries which we are importing are, first one is NumPy or Numeric Python, which is a library for array manipulation and is used to convert an array into an image. Then we have TensorFlow, which is a library used for faster numerical computation. After that, we are importing CV2. Now, CV2 is a library that comes with various functions for image processing and computer vision tasks. And finally, we are importing Time, which is a Python library that allows us to work with time. Moving on, for initiation of faster RCNN model, we are calling the detector API class with pre-trained model as input. Once we have loaded the checkpoints of the model, we will initiate graph. Thereafter, we will define input and output tensors for detection underscore graph and then define each box which represents a part of the image where a particular object was detected and each score represent the level of confidence for each of the objects. The score is shown on the result of the image together with the class label. So that's the main processing of this class. Let's now go to the main function. Now, in this main function, which is defined in the if condition, we are defining the path of the video. Now, in case of Windows, there is no change required to be done in the code other than defining the exact location of the current folder structure which I have defined here. So you have to specify the exact location of your pre-trained model here. But for Linux, you have to comment this line and uncomment this other line for the model path. Apart from this, one more thing you have to make changes that the input video path which I am specifying here. Again for Windows, no change. You just have to specify the path where the input video is located. But for Linux, comment this line and uncomment this line so that your code runs smoothly. Coming back to code. If we look down here, what we are doing? We are breaking the video which is actually a combination of frames into single frames for object detection. In this, we are using, if we see here, cap.read function. This function reads a video frame by frame and then post resizing of image for input. We are calling process frame function of detected API class with this frame as input. Let me show you this function as well. So this is my process frame function. As a first step in this process frame function, it expands dimensions since the trained model expects images to have a proper acceptable shape, which is usually in the format of 1, none, none, 3, which I have put up here also. Then it starts with the actual detection in the session run. Once the object has been identified, it prepares the box list of identified object in the image. Now, when this is returned along with the confidence score and classes details to the calling function, where we are processing all frames of the video, we use this data for visualization of the results of a detection. Next, we extract this boundary details of identified object, draw a rectangle around that detected object, and also place the name of the class label on the top of recognized object in the image. Once that has been embedded on image, 
we are first going to save it into our output video using out dot write frame by frame and then display the image using I am show function of OpenCV. Also note that the names of all classes is provided in sequence in the coco.names file and all these classes of objects can be identified through the code. Let me now show you the coco.names file as well. So here we can see a list of objects. So all these objects can be identified through this code. These are in total 88 such objects. Let me now go to the main file. So this is the main file which you have to run. Let me now run the code here. So as we can see in this recorded video, there are different persons walking in a town center and the code is able to identify if we can see here all these persons and also the code is able to identify the bicycle also. So if you see clearly a red boundary box is drawn around the object as well as a label is being displayed on the top listing the object type. So like for a person walking person label is being displayed and for a bicycle, a bicycle label is being displayed. So with this, we have learned how to do object detection using faster RCNN. I will now explain the code download instructions for the project. So in the resources section of this lecture, you will find faster rcnn.zip file which you have to download and then unzip. After unzip, open the project in PyCharm and in the project, you will find faster underscore rcnn underscore object detection dot py file. This is the main Python file that you have to execute. Also, the folder will contain frozen inference graph dot pb, which is the pre-trained model. We also have coco dot names that contains the classes of 88 objects that we can detect through our code. The folder will also have this town center dot avi file which is my input video file and finally it will also have requirements.txt which you have to install as a part of configuration of the project. In addition to this, how to use requirements.txt configuration, that's something I have already explained in the code walkthrough session. Welcome back. The focus area of this module is to explain the object detection model. We are going to start with RetinaNet model that was developed by Facebook AI research team and then move on to understand the architecture of SSD model. Post this, we will move on to cover the YOLO model series where we are going to cover the YOLO v3 model first and then move on to understand YOLO v3 tiny model and finally close with YOLO v4 model which is one of the most popular object detection models in the industry right now. So, let's begin. RetinaNet model was introduced by Facebook AI research team to tackle dense and small object detection problem. It is a single unified network composed of a backbone network and two task-specific sub-networks. Now, if you look at the architecture diagram of RetinaNet model on the screen, we can see that RetinaNet uses a feature pyramid network backbone on top of a feed-forward ResNet architecture to generate a rich, multi-scale, convolutional feature pyramid. Now, to this backbone, RetinaNet attaches two sub-networks, one for classifying anchor boxes and Another one for regressing from anchor boxes to ground truth object boxes. As we can see here, the network design is quite simple and focus is on a novel focal loss function that eliminates the accuracy gap between our one stage detector and state of the art two stage detectors like faster RCNN with FPN while running at faster speeds. The RetinaNet focal loss function 
helps to alleviate the problem of the extreme foreground background class imbalance as well. SST or single shot detector is an object detection model which predict all at once the bounding box and the class probabilities with an end-to-end -end CNN architecture. On a high level, the SST model uses extra feature layers from different feature maps of the network in order to increase the number of relevant bounding boxes and image with most relevant ground boxes is chosen as input. Post that, during training, boxes localization is modified to the best match. The SSD approach is based on a feed-forward convolutional network that produces a fixed size collection of bounding boxes and scores for the presence of object class instances in those boxes followed by a non-maximum suppression step to produce the final detections. As we can see in the architecture diagram on the screen, the early network layers are based on a standard architecture such as VGT16 network used for high quality image classifications which is called as a base network. And then we add convolutional feature layers to the end of this base network wherein each added feature layer or optionally an existing feature layer from the base network can produce a fixed set of detection predictions using a set of convolutional filters. You can see these extra feature layers in the diagram which predict the offsets to default boxes of different scales and aspect ratios along with their associated confidence. So for a feature layer say of size m by n with p channels, the basic element for predicting parameters of a potential detection would be 3 by 3 by p small kernel that produces either a score for a category or a shape offset relative to the default box coordinates. At each of the m by n locations where the kernel is applied, it produces an output value. The bounding box offset output values are then measured relative to a default box position relative to each feature map location. So this is how the architecture of SSD model works out. Now, with respect to accuracy and speed, SSD model gives a better performance and faster RCNN and is chosen for object detection in real time as well. YOLO is a real time object recognition algorithm that reframe object detection as a single regression problem straight from image pixels to bonding box coordinates and also class probabilities. Using YOLO, as the name suggests, you only look once at an image to predict what objects are present and where they are. This is a different approach as most of the object detection models use regions to localize the object within the image and network looks at parts of image which have high probabilities of containing the object. With YOLO, things are different as in YOLO, a single convolutional network predicts the bounding boxes and the class probabilities for these boxes in a single evaluation. Let's now understand how YOLO works. If you look at the diagram on the screen, as a first step, YOLO takes an input image which is divided into several grids wherein each grid has a dimension of S by S. Then, bounding box regression is used to highlight the object. Herein, a bounding box is an outline that highlights an object in an image where every bounding box of image contains attributes such as width, height, class and bounding box center. So, YOLO predicts the bounding boxes and their corresponding class probabilities for objects. After that, Intersection over union, also called as IOU, is used to provide an output box that surrounds the objects perfectly where IOU or intersection over union can be understood as a process in object detection that describes how boxes overlap. 
the intersection over union or iou ensures that the predicted bounding boxes are equal to the real boxes of the objects thus eliminating unnecessary bounding boxes that do not meet the characteristics of the objects like height and width hence the final detection will consist of unique bounding boxes that fit the objects perfectly yolo is quite faster than other object detection algorithms if we think it from a performance perspective since we frame detection as a regression problem we don't need a complex pipeline we simply run our neural network on a new image at test time to predict detections in addition to this YOLO achieves more than twice the mean average precision of other real time systems also when we use other object detection algorithms one of the common drawback is that sometimes they detect an object multiple times rather than detecting an object only once YOLO uses non maximum suppression also called as nms which ensures that the object is detected only once If we look at the challenges around YOLO then one limitation with YOLO is that it struggles with detection of small objects within an image due to the spatial constraints of the algorithm now there have been multiple versions of YOLO released in the market for example YOLO v1 YOLO v2 and YOLO v3 the first version YOLO v1 laid out the general architecture and YOLO v2 was all about refining that design and using predefined anchor boxes to improve the bounding box proposal coming to yolo v3 it did further enhancements and refined the model architecture and training process by using multi skill predictions and using darknet 53 for feature extraction on a high level yolo v3 makes detection at three different scales and also generates more bounding boxes per image In addition to this object confidence and class prediction in YOLO v3 are predicted through logistic regression and it performs multi label classification for objects detected in images YOLO v3 predicts an objectness score for each bounding box using logistic regression so if the bounding box prior that is the anchor overlaps a ground truth object more than others then the corresponding objectness score should be 1 for other priors with overlap greater than a predefined threshold where my default is 0.5 they incur no extra cost so we can see that each ground truth object is associated with one boundary box prior only in case a bounding box prior is not assigned it incurs no classification and localization loss just the confidence loss on the objectness thus YOLO v3 makes three predictions per location and each prediction consists of a boundary box objectness and class scores we will now take a look at YOLO v3 tiny object detection model this model detects objects faster without compromising on the accuracy this model adds residual network structures between the original convolutional layers which helps the network to further extract features from the target and reduce information loss when information is transmitted between deep convolution layers which helps in increasing the accuracy if we look at the architecture diagram of yolo v3 tiny model on the screen then we can see that the backbone network of yolo v3 tiny is a seven layer standard convolution structure rather than a darknet series YOLO v3 tiny is the same as the end to end object detection method first the input layer is a 416 by 416 image and then after 10 convolutions and 6 sub sampling operations the output feature maps have a size of 13 by 13 at the same time the feature map after the fifth down sampling is unsampled and convolved to obtain a size of 26 by 26 by 128 and it is subjected to standard convolution twice to obtain a size of 26 by 26 by 
The output feature maps of both scales contain the prediction information of objects. From an implementation perspective, YOLO v3 Tiny can be considered as a lightweight variant of YOLO v3, which takes less learning time, that is, it is fast but has less accuracy as compared to YOLO v3. YOLO v4 is an efficient and powerful object detection model that was designed to provide fast operating speed of an object detector in production systems and for optimization for parallel computation. It comprised of CSP Darknet 53 as a backbone that augments the learning capacity of CNN and the spatial pyramid pooling section is attached overhead to CSP Darknet 53 for improving the receptive field and to distinguish effectively the highly important context features. Also, the PANET is deployed in terms of the method for parameter aggregation for distinctive detector levels. In addition to this, YOLO v4 comes with bag of freebies and bag of specials. So what are these? As a part of training process of a model, several improvements can be done, such as data augmentation, class imbalance, cost function, etc. to increase accuracy. These changes and improvements don't show any impact on inference speed and are known as bag of freebies. Also, improvements that have an impact on the inference time marginally and return in a good performance are known as bag of specials. These improvements also involve increment of the receptive field, the implementation of attention, feature assimilation like skip connections and FPN, and post-processing features like non-maximum elimination. Let's now understand the architecture of YOLO v4 model. So if you look at the diagram on the screen, we can see that first of all we have as a backbone of YOLO v4, CSP Darknet 53 that is responsible for extracting deep features of the input image through five rest block bodies which are indicated in the diagram from C1, C2, C3, C4 and C5. The network contains 53 convolution layers with a size of 1 by 1 and 3 by 3 and each convolution layer is connected with a batch normalization layer and a mesh activation layer. Furthermore, all activation functions in YOLO v4 are replaced with leaky ReLU that requires less computation. So if you look at the diagram, the CVL indicates the convolution plus batch normalization plus leaky ReLU which I just explained. In addition to this, SPPNet effectively increased the receptive field of the model through different max pooling layers with a size of 5, 9 and 13 and PANNET uses top-down and bottom-up approaches to extract feature repeatedly. As an output, we can see three YOLO heads, Y1, Y2 and Y3 with sizes of 19 by 19, 38 by 38 and 76 by 76 respectively, which are used to fuse and interact with feature maps of different scales to detect objects of different sizes. From a performance benchmark, in YOLO v4, the accuracy and speed are greatly improved. However, YOLO v4 is still not optimized for scenarios that has numerous small objects and accuracy gets compromised in such scenarios. For example, in autonomous driving scenarios, where there exist a lot of small and distant objects on the road like pedestrian, vehicles, traffic signs, etc., accuracy would not come out to be that bright. Nevertheless, YOLO v4 is an efficient and powerful object detection model that enables anyone with a 1080Ti or 2080Ti GPU to train a super fast and accurate object detector. Welcome back to our second project. In this project, you will learn how you can do license number plate recognition using YOLO v3 model. We are going to start with project overview. Where I am going to explain the high level design of the project and the solution. Then we are going to move on to code walkthrough. Where I am going to explain the source code of the project. Along with instructions on how you can do execution of the code. 
and finally i am going to provide you code download instruction so that you can run the project yourself so let's begin welcome to the project license number plate recognition wherein we are recognizing the license number plate from a video recorded via web camera this data can be further analyzed to compare records and issue challenges this data is very useful for various law enforcement agencies for better traffic management in fact this image processing technology of automatic number plate recognition is now being widely adopted in commercial space as well for electronic toll collection visitor management system and parking management from a technical perspective in this project we are using yolo to detect objects and entities by using convolutional neural network or cnn wherein neural network in yolo uses weights trained by the user through annotated training data here in yolo takes an image as an input puts it through a neural network and gives the output in the image through bounding boxes for this project i am going to use pycharm for code walkthrough which we have already installed as a part of tool setup post code walkthrough i'll also give you the code download instructions so that you can understand how you can execute the project welcome to the code walkthrough session of license number plate detection using yolo v3 I will start with showing you the project structure and code dependencies. As a first step, you have to open PyCharm and for that you have to go to command prompt and write PyCharm there. Once PyCharm has been open, you need to browse to the projects and from there select the project files if it's already not selected. So if you see on the screen, I have already opened PyCharm and I have also opened the project of license number plate within PyCharm. Next thing what we have to do we have to configure the python interpreter for the project and for that we have to create a virtual environment to do so go to the file menu click on settings now once the setting page opens up it, within this you have to select python interpreter and go to this drop down click on show all Now here we have to create the virtual environment. So for that click on the plus icon. Now if you see we are creating a virtual environment. I have named it as VENV. You can give it any name of your choice. So just type that name and click on okay. So now it's creating the virtual environment for us. so we can see on the screen the virtual environment has been created this virtual environment comes with a default pip and setup packages now just click on okay and then again click on okay here so we can see the indexing has been completed for the project The next step is to install the requirements and for that you will see a pop up on the top which says install requirements so you have to click on this install requirements this is going to install all the required packages that we need to have to run the project so let's just click on this and here you have to click on install so we can see here requirements.txt has been successfully installed now 
In some scenarios, you might get this problem that requirements.txt does not install correctly and start giving you errors. In such cases, what you need to do? You have to open the requirements.txt file. Now, this has the list of all the packages which you need to install. Once you open this file, go to the terminal and there type pip install and copy the name of the package from here. And just paste the package here and then press enter. So this will install this package for the project. Same way, repeat this step for all the packages listed here. And with this, all the requirements for the project would be installed. Now, this has to be done only if your requirements.txt is giving you errors. Otherwise, we are good to go. If you look at the project structure, then I have given you the code which can be executed to identify license plate on recorded videos and even on web cameras. With this code, I have also provided pre-trained weights for identification of license numbers. If you have some custom format of numbers, then the training code is also provided. We are here identifying the license plate number on recorded videos. However, it can be executed on live feed through webcam as well. In this code, you have the option to identify the license plate number on images as well. So if you want to run this code for images, then what you have to do, go to the main and within this, you have to uncomment this line, this folder in path which has been set for images and comment this line of code for videos and then you will be all set to run this code for images as well. Let's now move on to understand what we are doing in the code. So as a first step, we are importing some libraries. These libraries are, first of all, it is CV2. Now CV2 is a library that comes with various functions for image processing and computer vision tasks. Then I'm importing PyTestRack, which is a wrapper for Google's TestRack OCR engine. Next, I have the OS library, which is used for working on operating system dependent functionality. Then I have time. Time is a Python library which allows you to work with time that is self-explanatory. And finally, I have pandas, which is a library used for data analysis. Now, if you look at the code, the main function, what we are doing, we are first specifying the width and height of input image as 416. Then we are giving the configuration and weight files for the model and loading the network using them. After this, we are importing the config and the weight file and doing setup of model using cv2.dnn.readnet from darknet function, which you can see here. Now, when we are working on Windows, we open the video file and then create a 4D blob from a frame and sets the input to the network. This will run the forward pass to get output of the output layers and remove the bounding boxes with low confidence. Moving on in the code, we are specifying the configuration for Tesseract. Then we are running Tesseract OCR on the image and then data is finally being stored in the CSV file and we are finally printing the recognized text. As you have seen above, we are importing two functions from model.py. Let me open model.py as well. Now, in this we are passing input of a frame to get outputs names function, which basically gets the name of output layers. We are using it first to get all the layers in the network and then to find the names of output layers with unconnected outputs. And then we pass this output to the post processing function, which is my post process function that you can see here. This post process function removes the bounding boxes with low confidence when the image and output are passed as attributes. 
So this function scans through all the bounding boxes output from the network and keep only the ones with high confidence scores and also assign the box class label as the class with the highest score. Along with this, it removes the bounding boxes with low confidence using non-maxima suppression. Please note that post process function internally calls the drop red function which you can see here. Now this function what it does it draws a bounding box in an image when attributes like class name, confidence, coordinates and the image itself is passed through it. Now within drop red function which you can see here on this model.py file we are first loading the names of classes then appending all different classes into the list classes. After that we are drawing a bounding box and then getting the label for the class name and its confidence and finally displaying the label at the top of the bounding box. So this is the whole functioning of this project. Let me now execute the code. To execute the code I have run the main.py file. So now we can see the license plate number is being read from the video and same is being highlighted in the video using the green color bounding box. Also a label of CS is coming. Now CS here is confidence score. So confidence score 1 means it's a 100% accuracy here. Now if I move on to my second video, let me just press escape. Now in this second video as well, it is reading the license number plate of different vehicles and highlighting them also in the green bounding box along with the confidence score which is my CS that is being displayed as a label on the top. So with this we have learned how to do license number plate identification using YOLO V3 model. I will now explain the code download instructions for this project. So in the resources section of this lecture, you will find license number plate detection YOLO V3.zip file which you have to download and unzip. Once you unzip this folder, you have to open this in PyCharm where you are going to find main.py and model.py files. Apart from this, you will also get test underscore dataset folder which contains the images and videos for testing purpose and also YOLO underscore utils which contains the configuration file, weights and the class name file. To execute the code as I have explained earlier you have to execute the main.py file. Welcome to the project YOLO v3 training for license number plate. As a part of this project, I am going to start with a project overview wherein I am going to explain the high level design and architecture of the project. Then we are going to move on to code walkthrough where I am going to explain in detail the source code of the project along with instructions on how to do the configuration and project setup as well as how to execute the code. Finally, I will provide you the code download instruction so that you can train your model using Google Cola. I am now going to explain you the overview of the project YOLO V3 training for license number plate. To start with, in this project we are using the darknet YOLO V3 model as the base model and then training our images on top of it. So what is darknet here? Darknet is an open source neural network framework written in C and CUDA which supports both GPU and CPU computation. Darknet is a very fast and highly accurate framework for real-time object detection and is heavily used for image detection as well. I am providing you the base model for Darknet in this project which you can download from the resources section of the lecture. Also, as a training data in the project, we are using car license plate images for training. I have already segregated the testing and training images in two separate folders and zipped them. This data has been provided along with the project resources 
which you can download from the resources section of the project. Welcome to the code walkthrough session of YOLO V3 training for license number plate detection. In this, I am going to explain how we have trained the YOLO V3 model. But before jumping to code, let's understand a high level overview about the project. In this project, to train the YOLO model, we first take a cornet pre-trained on YOLO, remove the last fully connected layer, then Treat the rest of the continent as a fixed feature extractor for the new data set and then train a linear classifier, for example, linear SVM or softmax classifier for the new data set. Thus, instead of building the model from scratch, we will be using a pre-trained network and applying transfer learning to create our final model. Also, as the data set available to us is very minimal, so it is best to leverage transfer learning for good results. Please note that YOLO is an object detection algorithm that applies a single neural network to the full image. This network divides the image into regions and predicts the bounding boxes and probabilities for each region. These bounding boxes are then weighted by the predicted probabilities. With respect to training data, we first need to get the images of Indian cars with a number plate, create two folders, test and train, and transfer 20% of the images in test and 80% of the images in train folder respectively. I have already done this segregation and you will have two different zip files, one for test and one for train available to you for download in the resources section. I am also providing you a Jupyter Notebook file in the resources section which can be uploaded to Google Colab. Now let's move on the code. So if you see on the screen, I have already opened the code in Google Colab. Let's now understand what we are doing in this Google Colab Notebook. As a first step, we are cloning the GitHub code repository of Darknet for YOLO and then compiling the code for execution. Let me just run this now. Since we are running the code on GPU, we have to make sure that GPU is selected in the runtime. And for that, go to the runtime menu. And here, click on change runtime type. And make sure we have GPU as the hardware accelerator. Apart from this, there is one more change required to use GPU and for that, you have to go to darknet folder and within that to the make file. Let's just do that right away. We have to open the make file. Within this, we have to make sure this GPU, CUDNN and OpenCVR set to 1 and CUDNN underscore half is set to 0. Let's just do these changes right away. Save the file. And then close this file. Now we are changing the directory. Let's just run this. And then we are compiling the darknet code for current environment by running the make command.
Next, we are uploading mydata.zip, train.zip, test.zip, and darknet.zip files to Google Drive, which can then be imported to Google Colab environment. And now we are mounting the Google Drive where we have uploaded the zip data files. Let me just mount the drive now. Next, we are changing the directory. And now we are going to unzip the my underscore data dot zip in the darknet folder. We are also going to unzip the darknet.zip folder. And then we are unzipping the train.zip and test.zip files as well. Before starting training, we are going to create weights folder under my underscore data folder so that we can store the trained model there. And finally, we will begin the training on the custom images using the command from the darknet directory. So let's just start the training now. So as we can see here, the training is still going on, but the weights have been generated. To find the weights, you can go to the my underscore data folder. Within that, you can go to weights folder. And as we can see here, the YOLO V3 last weights have been generated. The training will go on for a couple of more hours, but now I'm going to stop the training and tell you the next steps around it. So if we look here at these figures, what do these represent? Now, this first figure, this 258 represents the current training iteration. Then we have this 1.420468. This is my total loss. Ideally, it should be 0 0.03 for good results. So I'll suggest that when you are working on this project, let this training continue for a couple of hours until you get the this figure as less than or equal to 0.03. After that, we have the average loss error. It should also be as low as possible. Ideally, 0.05 would be a good figure for this. Next, we have the learning rate. This is the current learning rate. After this, we have this time in seconds, which actually indicates the total time spent to process this batch. And finally, it displays the total amount of images used during training so far. So as we can see here, there are still this much hours left for training to be completed. So when you are running the project, complete the training until the figure is less than 0 0.03 for the error. Now, once the training has been completed, post training, what you have to do? You have to download the latest weight file with the extension .weights from the Google Colab. Rename it to lapi.weights in your local folder. Now here, we will replace the existing set of weights in a pre-trained project with this new set of weights that we have trained on the images by copying them into YOLO underscore utils folder. So with this, we have successfully trained a YOLO V3 model on custom images and this model can be used for identification of different types of number plates. We will now look at the code download instructions. So in the resources section of this lecture, you are going to find YOLO v3 training for license number plate notebook file 
which you need to download and open in Google Colab. Along with this, you will also have to download the data set that contains the zip files for test.zip, train.zip, mydata.zip and darknet.zip. The test.zip file is for test images, train.zip has training images, mydata.zip contains the class names and the configuration file and finally darknet file is comprised of base rate file. To execute the code, you will have to run the notebook file which is my YOLO v3 training for license number plate file. The focus area of this module is to explain the concept of image classification and its various models. We are going to start with the introduction of image classification and then move on to understand how does image classification pipeline works in the industry. Post that, we will move on to image classification models and will first start with understanding the architecture of support vector machine or SVM model. Then we will move on to decision tree model. And finally, we will cover the K nearest neighbor that is the KNN model in detail. So let's begin. Image classification refers to a process in computer vision that can classify an image according to its visual content and involves assigning a label to an entire image or a digital photograph. For example, as you can see on the screen, an image classification algorithm can be designed to classify dogs or cats from images. An image classification takes a picture as an input and outputs a class which could be a cat or a dog or outputs a probability that the input is of a particular class depending on your scenario. The process of image classification is based on supervised learning. An image classification model is fed a set of images within a specific category. Based on this set, the algorithm learns which class the test image belongs to and can then predict the correct class of future image inputs and can even measure how accurate the predictions are. This process produces multiple challenges including scale variation, viewpoint variation, intra-class variation, image deformation, image occlusion, illumination conditions and sometimes background clutter can also cause a problem. Some examples of image classification include labeling an x-ray as cancer or not using binary classification, classifying a handwritten digit using multi-class classification and assigning a name to a photograph of a face again using multi-class classification. In image classification, we define a set of target classes that is objects to identify images and train a model to recognize them using labeled example photos. Some of the most popular models for image classification in the industry are support vector machine, VGG16, VGG19, ResNet50 and Inception V3 model. When we look at image classification pipeline, it comprises of four main tasks. Let's spend some time to understand each of these tasks. So you have the diagram of image classification pipeline on the screen. Let's start with the first step, which is image pre-processing, within which the image data and its features is improved by suppressing unwanted distortions and by enhancing of some important image features. This is done so that we can get the data ready for further processing. Few of the most common techniques used within image pre-processing are, first of all, converting the color images to grayscale to reduce the computational complexity. Then we have standardizing the images, that is, we resize the images in the data set to a unified dimension based on the scenario. And lastly, we have data augmentation, which is augmenting the existing data set with perturbed versions of the existing images so that model is capable to recognize objects when they appear in any form and shape. This is very useful as by doing this, we are not only able to generate more data from the limited data, but also prevents overfitting. The second task in image classification pipeline is detection of object wherein we localize the object through image segmentation 
so as to identify the position of object of interest. Next, we have feature extraction and training. Herein, feature extraction refers to the deep learning methods which are used to identify the unique features within a specific class as well as most interesting patterns of the image so that these features can help the model to differentiate between different classes. And training is the process where a model learns the features from its data set. Finally, we have classification of object within which detected objects are classified into predefined classes by using any of the image classification techniques that compares the image patterns with the target patterns. Support vector machines or SVMs are greatly influenced by statistical learning theory and have been widely applied to machine vision fields such as character, images, handwritten digit, and text recognition, as well as satellite image classification. They are used for classification as well as regression. So, how do they function? SVM functions by using non-linear projection of the training data in the input space to a feature space of higher dimension by use of a kernel function. Thus, building a hyperplane, which you can see in the diagram on the screen, that results in a linearly separatable data set that can be separated by a linear classifier. Usually, classification in high dimension feature spaces results in overfitting in the input space. But with SVMs or support vector machines, overfitting is controlled through the principle of structural risk minimization. Also, the risk of misclassification is minimized by maximizing the margin between the data points and the decision boundary. So, while implementing a support vector machine or SVM, we plot each data item as a point in n-dimensional space where n signifies the number of features you have with the value of each feature being the value of a particular coordinate. Then, we perform classification by finding the hyperplane that differentiates the two classes very well and support vectors are the coordinates of individual observation. Now, if we look at the diagram on the screen, we can see the hyperplane as well as the support vectors, which are actually the data points that are closer to the hyperplane and influence the position and orientation of the hyperplane. Using these support vectors, we can maximize the margin of the classifier. Also, one very important thing to remember in SVM is the role of kernel here. Kernel are the functions that are used to project the data from input space to feature space. The most commonly used kernels are linear kernel, Gaussian kernel and polynomial kernel. SVM is more productive in high dimension spaces and is quite memory efficient. But there is one challenge that it is not suitable for large data sets and does not perform very well when data set has more noise, that is, when our target classes are overlapping with each other. Decision tree is a supervised learning algorithm that has been widely used in classification purposes for aerial and information-based images and is usually the key component of many remote sensing applications in the industry right now. In fact, it is one of the most intuitive algorithms that generates a decision tree to classify the data. At each branching, a specific decision rule is implemented which may involve one or more combinations of the attribute inputs or features. From a structure perspective, if we look at the architecture diagram of decision tree on the screen, we can see that a decision tree is composed of a root node which is the top node a set of interior nodes that represent the features and terminal nodes also called as leaf nodes or leaves that represent the outcome or final classification. The classification process in the decision tree is implemented by a set of rules that determine the path to be followed, starting from the root node and ending at the terminal node, which represents the label for the object being classified. So, each non-terminal node contains a binary criteria which evaluates a statement to either true or false. Depending on the decision for a given data point, 
we proceed to the next node. So at each non-terminal node, a decision has to be taken about the path to the next node as we can see in the image on the screen. So how does a decision tree function? To start with, the decision tree algorithm selects the best attribute using attribute selection measures, also known as ASM, to split the records. Attribute selection measures or ASM is nothing but a rule for selecting the splitting criteria that partition the data into the best possible manner. It provides a rank to each feature or attribute by explaining the given data set. Best score attribute will be selected as a splitting attribute. Few of the most commonly used selection measures are, first of all, information gain, which is based on the concept of entropy, that is, uncertainty associated with a random variable. It is calculated as the amount of information gained about a random variable or signal from observing another random variable. Then we have gain ratio which is a modification of the information gain that reduces its bias. Gain ratio takes number and size of branches into account when choosing an attribute. Thus, it corrects the information gain by taking the intrinsic information of a split into account. Herein, intrinsic information is entropy of distribution of instances into branches, that is, how much information do we need to tell which branch an instance belongs to? And after that, we have Guinea index, which is the criteria for calculating information gain. It calculates the amount of probability of a specific feature that is classified incorrectly when selected randomly. During classification, the attribute with minimum Guinea index is chosen as the splitting attribute. The biggest advantage of decision tree is that it can be easily used to visualize and interpret non-linear data patterns and also they work pretty fast, especially in the cases of exploratory data analysis. But one major disadvantage with decision tree is overfitting of data which ultimately leads to wrong predictions. In order to fit the data, even noisy data, it keeps generating new and new nodes and ultimately, the tree becomes too complex to interpret. K-nearest neighbor or KNN is a simple, easy to implement supervised learning algorithm that can be used to solve both image classification and regression problems. It is widely used in credit rating, data pre-processing, pattern recognition, recommendation systems and stock price prediction. It is usually defined using two keywords. The first one being non-parametric, which essentially means that it does not make any assumptions about the underlying data distribution. And second keyword is lazy learner, as it does not learn from the training set immediately. Instead, it stores data set and does not build a model until a query is performed on the data set. So, it's considered an idle algorithm for data mining. From an implementation perspective, K-nearest neighbor or KNN can be visualized as a data classification method for estimating the likelihood that a data point will become a member of one group or another based on what group the data point nearest to it belongs to. To explain it better through an example, suppose you have two classes A and B as you can see in the diagram on the screen. Now, if you want to determine whether a data point is in group A or group B, the algorithm looks at the states of data points near it. If the majority of data points are in group A, it's very likely the data point in question is in group A and vice versa. So how does this KNN function at the code implementation level? In KNN, we first load the data and then initialize K to the chosen number of neighbors. Then, for each example in the data, we calculate the distance measure between the data point and its nearest neighbor. There are many techniques to calculate this distance. But Euclidean distance is the most commonly used distance function or metric. Then we store the distances on an ordered list and sort it. After this, we choose the top k entries from the sorted list and finally label the test point based on the majority of classes present in the selected point.
के नियरेस्ट नेबर और के नर एलगोथम इज क्वाइट रोबर्स टू द नॉइजी ट्रेनिंग डेटा इज सिंपल टू इम्प्लीमेंट एंड कैन ऑल्सो हैंडल मल्टी क्लास डेटा इजिली बट द एसोसिएटेड कंप्यूटेशन कॉस्ट कैन बी हाई बिकॉज it is calculating the distance between the data points for all the training samples that you are going to feed it welcome to the project traffic sign detection and training using spm i am going to start this project through a project overview session where i am going to explain the high level design of the project and its architecture then i am going to proceed to code walk through where i am going to explain in detail the source code of the project along with the instructions on how to do the configuration and how to execute the project as well finally i am going to provide you with the code download instructions so that you can run the project and practice yourself so let's begin the project traffic sign detection and training using svm designs a traffic sign detection and classification system on videos using opencv The detection phase uses image processing techniques that create contours on each video frame and find all ellipses or circles among those contours. They are marked as candidates for the traffic signs. The detection strategy that has been adopted is first of all we increase the contrast and dynamic range of the video frame then we remove the unnecessary colors like green with hsv color range after that we use laplacian of gaussian to display border of objects then we are going to make contours by binarization and then detect ellipse like and circle like contours there once that has been done in the next phase that is the classification phase a list of images are created by cropping from the original frame based on the candidates coordinate and then a pre-trained svm model will classify these images to find out which type of traffic sign they are so that is a high level overview of the project welcome to the code walk through session of the project traffic sign detection and training using svm i have opened the project in pycharm Next thing is to configure the interpreter for the project and for that you have to go to the file menu settings python interpreter here and we can see in the drop down that there is no interpreter right now selected for the project so just click on this drop down show all and then you have to click on this plus sign here Now we are creating a new virtual environment for this project. I have named it as VENV as you can see here. You can give it any name of your choice. After putting the name, just click on okay. And this is going to create the virtual environment for you. so we can see here that the virtual environment has been created for the project so now just click on okay here and then apply and then okay here now next thing is to install the requirements that is the packages which are required for the project to run and for that you can see this pop up above so you just have to click on install requirements here and click on install for these packages so we can see that requirements.txt has been successfully installed so now the project has all the packages it require for execution 
Sometimes it might happen that your requirement or txt does not execute properly and start giving you errors. If that is the case, what you need to do? You will have to open the requirements.txt file. Now this file has a list of all the packages and the version numbers that you need for the project to run. So once you open this file, you have to go to terminal and there type pip install and copy the name of the package. So I'll just copy the name of the package from here and paste it here and simply click on enter. This will make sure that this package is installed. Repeat the same step for the other package also which is the OpenCV Python. But remember, do these steps only if your requirements.txt is giving you any kind of issues. Let's move forward now. Now let's take a look at the code. Herein we have three Python files. First one is main.py which is the start point of the program. Then we have classification.py. Let me just open that. Now this file contains the SVM model to classify the traffic signs and then we have common.py. Common.py basically has functions for defining SVM model and some common routines used by other functions. Coming back to main.py, at the start of the code we are importing various libraries. Let's take a look at those libraries now. The first library we are importing is cv2. CV2 is a library that comes with various functions for image processing and computer vision tasks. Then we have NumPy or Numeric Python, which is a library for array manipulation and is used to convert an array into image. Then we have the Math library, which has functions to deal with mathematical operations. After that, we have ArcParse library, which is used for command line module parsing. Then we have OS library which is used for operating system dependent functionality. If we look further in the code, then after importing libraries, what we are doing? We are defining the currently supported traffic signs. Now, the name of each signs file here is corresponding to the class in SVM. Let me now show you the folder structure of the training data set corresponding to each classes defined in the code. So if you go to the project folder and then data set, in this you will find these various folders. So if I open the zero folder, this has various images. Zero here correspond to error in this code, which means that class zero is error, which means when it doesn't get any sign from the test data, which we have provided against each class, then it comes as error. So we can say that this folder has images of non-traffic sign. Then we have class 1 which is stop and if we go to the folder structure, the folder structure has all the traffic signs for stop here. There are different images for stop. Coming back to the code, we have class 2 as turn left. So if I go to the folder structure, this has all different signs of turning left here. Coming back to code. We have class 3 which is my turn right sign and corresponding to this I have various images for turning right. So same way I have various classes here. So I have the class 4 as do not turn left. Then I have class 5 for do not turn right. Then I have class 6 for no circle. Class 7 is for speed limit of 40. Class 8 is for speed limit of 30. Class 9 is one way. Class 10 is no entry, class 11 is other and class 12 is also one way. So you might see there are two one ways here but the signs are different in both of them. The images are different. Let me just show you that also. So these are the images for class 12 and these are for class 9. One thing to remember here is that only the biggest sign in the current frame is cropped and classified when we run the code. The SVM model is trained each time the main.py is called before the detection phase. But I still save the model in data underscore svm.dat file to implement the model reload function. So what happens when I run the code, 
data underscore SVM dot DAT is saved after training. Now in the detection code, if a traffic sign is detected, it will be tracked until it disappears or there is another bigger sign in the frame. The tracking method is dense optical flow. The data set folder contains the images for training SVM models. I have just shown you the folder structure also. So there are 12 folders containing cropped images of traffic signs. Each folder is named as the class of the traffic sign it contains. The special zero folder contains non-traffic sign cropped images which can be recognized as traffic signs in the detection phase. The data set is created by applying the detection phase on many videos with various parameters to mark all traffic signs and then manually separating them into their right classes. Each time we run the program, the data set can be updated by checking all the generated cropped images of detected traffic sign and then find all the misclassified traffic signs. Now let's see what we are doing next in the code. So if we look at the main function in main.py file, we are first calling the training function from classification.py to train the SVM model on current data set and then saving the file in data underscore svm dot dat. Then we are reading the frames from the video and initializing the termination criteria for cam shift indicating a maximum of 10 iterations or movement by at least one pixel along with the bounding box of the ROI using OpenCV algorithm. After that, what we are doing? We are splitting our video into frames and for each frame, we will be calling different functions one by one for detection of classes defined in the SVM model. In this, we will first call the localization function wherein we are pre-processing the image first using pre-process function, then converting it into binary. In pre-processing of the image, we are first increasing the contrast and dynamic range of the video frame, then removing unnecessary colors and finally using Laplacian of Gaussian to display border of objects and then we are making contours using binarization. Thereafter, we remove the small components and then detect ellipse-like and circle-like contours and find the largest sign in the frame. Now, once we have identified our region of interest, we will call the getLabel function to classify the identified cropped images using SVM model. So we can see the getTable function is defined in classification.py file and in this we are performing few pre-processing steps and then load the model to predict the classes. It returns a number which correspond to a label defined initially on the code. So if no sign is detected then we mark it as others. Post identification of sign in a frame, we use OpenCV put text function to place predicted label on the cropped image. One thing to note here is that here we are using OpenCV cam shift that is continuously adaptive makeshift algorithm to track the sign in each frame of the video. The size of the window keeps updating when the tracking window tries to converge and the tracking is done by using the color information of the object. Please note that in the project I showed you that we have imported the arc parse library but we are not passing arguments from the command line. Instead, we have defined the default values in the code itself. As you can see in the if condition of main, we have defined the file name as input file name, minimum size component as 300 and also we have defined similarity contour with circle as 0.65. So this is how the code works. Let me now execute the code. So as you can see in the result video, we are able to detect the sign correctly for no circle.
Now, as we move forward, it has recorded the sign of speed limit. So, it's drawing a bounding box and also displaying a label on top of it. Then we have the traffic sign of turn right detected correctly. And again, one way sign has been detected. So with this, we have learned how we can do traffic sign detection using SVM algorithm. I will now explain the code download instructions for the project. So in the resource section of this lecture, you are going to find traffic sign detection and training using svm.zip file, which you have to download and then unzip. In this, you will get main.py, which is the main file that you need to open in PyCharm. Then we have classification.py that contains SVM model to classify traffic signs and common.py which has functions for defining SVM model and some common routines used by other functions. Besides this, dataset folder contains the images of various traffic signs and finally requirement.txt is the file that you have to install as a part of configuration. In order to execute the project, you have to run the main.py file in PyCharm to get the desired out. Welcome back. In this module, we will go through various image classification models. We will start with getting a basic understanding of VGG16 model, its architecture and performance parameters. Then we will look at ResNet 50 model along with its architecture. After that, I am going to move on to explain Inception V3 model and its advantages over the existing models. And finally, I will cover the Efficient Net model along with its architecture and various performance parameters. So, let's begin. VGG16 is a convolutional neural network architecture used for ImageNet, which is a large visual database project that is used in visual object recognition software research. It is also used in deep learning image classification techniques and has one of the most popular architectures in the industry right now. Let's now take a look at the architecture diagram of VGG16 model to understand it better. If we look at the diagram on the screen, the VGG16 has 16 layers, deep neural network and as an input, it takes an image of input size 224 by 224, which has three channels. So, if you look at the diagram, we have a tensor of 224 by 224 by 3 as our input. This model process the input image and outputs a vector of 1000 values. Herein, the first two layers have 64 channels of 3x3 three three filter size and same padding. Then, after a max pool layer of stride 2x2, two, two, two layers which have convolution layers of 256 filter size and filter size 3x3. Three after that, it has a max pooling layer of stride 2x2, two two, which is the same as previous layer. And then it has two convolution layers of filter size 3x3 three three and 256 filter, as you can see in the diagram. After that, there are two sets of three convolution layer and a max pool layer. Each has 512 filters of 3x3 three three size with same padding. This image is then passed to the stack of two convolution layers. After the stack of convolution and max pooling layer, we get a 7x7x512 seven by seven by feature map as you can see in the diagram. This is then flattened. So we flatten this output to make a feature vector and after this, 
there are three fully connected layers. The first layer takes the input from the last feature vector and outputs a 1 by 1 by 4096 vector and the second layer also outputs a vector. But the third output layer outputs a thousand channel for thousand classes as we can see in the output in the diagram. Now, from a performance perspective, the VGG16 model achieves 92.7% top 5 test accuracy in ImageNet. As I talked about earlier also, ImageNet is a data set of over 14 million images belonging to almost 1000 classes. But with this model, there are few challenges as well, especially around training as it's very slow to train and also since its size is huge, so it takes a lot of disk space and bandwidth that makes it not so efficient model. ResNet 50 or Residual Network 50 is a residual network that is 50 layers deep. Before moving ahead, let's build up some understanding of residual network. In deep learning, if you make a network deeper, it can hurt your ability to train the network to do well on the training set. And that's why sometimes you don't want a network that is too deep. Not only this, as we go deeper, the accuracy starts saturating and degrades also to some extent. So how to solve this problem? Residual learning is the solution to this. So what is residual learning? If we look at the architecture of a deep convolution neural network, then within it, several layers are stacked and are trained to the task at hand. The network learns several low, medium, high level features at the end of its layers. In residual learning, instead of trying to learn some features, we try to learn some residual. So what is residual? It can be simply understood as a subtraction of the feature learned from the input of that layer. So, ResNet does this through residual blocks which are created using shortcut connections by directly connecting input of nth layer to some n plus x random layer and then stacking them together to form a residual network. Let's now look at the architecture diagram of ResNet 50 model to understand how the concept we just talked about is implemented in the ResNet 50 model. So at the first, we have a convolution with a kernel size of 7 by 7 and 64 different kernels, all with a stride of size 2, giving us one layer. Next, we see a max pooling layer with also a stride size of 2. In the next convolution, there is a 1 by 164 kernel, following this a 3 by 364 kernel and at last we have 1 by 1256 kernel. These three kernels are repeated in a total of 3 times, so giving us 9 layers in this step. Next, we see a kernel of 1 by 1, 128 after the kernel of 3 by 3, 128 and at last we see a kernel of 1 by 1, 512 and this step is repeated 4 times. So, it gives us 12 layers in this step and after that, there is a kernel of 1 by 1, 256 and 2 more kernels with 3 by 3, 256 and 1 by 1, 1024 and this is repeated 6 times, giving us a total of 18 layers. And then again we have 1 by 1, 512 kernel with 2 more of 3 by 3, 512 and 1 by 1, 2048. And this is again repeated 3 times, thus giving us a total of 9 layers. After that we do an average pool and end it up with a fully connected layer containing 1000 nodes. And at the end, a softmax function. So, this gives us one layer. So, if I add up all these layers which I just explained, it is going to give me 1 plus 9 plus 12 plus 18 plus 9 plus 1 
and that equals to 50 layers deep convolution network. So that's how a ResNet 50 model functions. Within deep learning, we will now talk about Inception V3 model, which is a widely used image recognition model that has a convolution neural network architecture and attains significant accuracy. Inception V3 is a pre-trained convolution neural network that is 48 layers deep, which is a version of the network already trained on more than a million images from the ImageNet database. This pre-trained network can classify images into thousand object categories such as keyboard, mouse, pencil and many animals. As a result, the network has learned rich feature representations for a wide range of images. The network has an image input size of 299 by 299 and the model extract general features from input images in the first part as we can see on the diagram and then classifies them based on those features in the second part. The model extracts journal features from input images in the first part and classifies them based on those features in the second part as you can see in the diagram displayed on the screen. From an implementation perspective, the model is made up of symmetric and asymmetric building blocks including convolutions, average pooling, max pooling, concats, dropouts and fully connected layers. Batch norm is used extensively throughout the model and applied to activation inputs and loss is computed via softmax activation function. The inception model has several advantages over the earlier deep learning classifiers used for image classification such as VGGNet and ResNet models. Since inception was conceptualized with the main goal of increasing the computational efficiency, it has a hierarchy of complex inception modules to reduce parameter space and also employs smart factorization method to reduce the computational complexity. It even has reduction blocks to change the width and height of the grid leading to a well-designed network architecture. Thus, the computational cost of inception is lower than VGGNet and ResNet models. This makes it feasible to utilize inception model in big data scenarios where huge amount of data is needed to be processed at a reasonable cost or scenarios where memory or computation capacity is limited. For example, in mobile vision settings, it can be used. In deep learning, convolutional neural networks are usually developed at a fixed resource cost and then scaled up in order to achieve better accuracy. The conventional approach used to model scaling is by arbitrarily increasing the CNN depth or width or to use a larger input image resolution for training and evaluation. While these methods do improve accuracy to some extent, but then they require a lot of manual tuning and performance is also degraded. With efficient net model, a new model scaling method has been adopted that uses a simple yet highly effective compound coefficient to scale up the CNNs or convolutional neural networks in a more structured manner. Unlike conventional approaches that arbitrarily scale network dimensions such as width, depth and resolution, this method uniformly scales each dimension with a fixed set of scaling coefficients and this has led to the arrival of efficient net model. If we look at the architecture diagram on the screen, we can see that first a baseline network is designed by performing the neural architecture search, which is a technique for automating the design of neural networks. It optimizes both the accuracy and efficiency as measured on the floating point operations per second, also called as flops basis. 
This developed architecture uses the mobile inverted bottleneck convolution, also called as MBCON, as you can see on the screen. This baseline network is then scaled up to obtain a family of deep learning models called as efficient nets. From a performance perspective, efficient net has high accuracy and among various models, efficient net has 84.3 accuracy on ImageNet dataset. Welcome to the project Training ResNet Model for Image Classification. We are going to start this project with a project overview session where I am going to walk you through the high level design of the project. Then we are going to move to the code walkthrough session. In code walkthrough, I am going to explain the source code of the project and also what kind of configuration you need to run the project and also how to execute the project. Finally, I am going to provide you with the code download instruction so that you know how to run the project yourself. So, let's begin. We will now spend some time to understand what we are doing in the project ResNet model for image classification. In this project, we are building a ResNet model for image classification using a small data set. As a part of data set, we have taken 20 classes comprising of wide variety of images such as waterfall, airplanes, school bus, fireworks to name a few of them. From a project structure perspective, the project has three folders of data set. First of all, we have a training data set folder containing around 1500 images. Then we have a test data set with 400 images. And finally, we have a validation data set containing 100 images. In this, we will be using transfer learning from a ResNet V252 model and then training it on our custom images for image classification. We have already learned about ResNet model, so we are not going to go into deep here. Just to recap, ResNet model is a deep learning model that uses residual learning, wherein deep neural networks are trained using identity mapping for shortcut connections. I am going to give you a walkthrough on this project through Google Colab. So let's move to the code walkthrough session now. Welcome to the code walkthrough session for the project Training ResNet Model for Image Classification. Now, I have opened the project using Google Colab and I am going to run this on GPU. To make sure it's running on GPU, I have to change the settings and for that, you have to go to Runtime, change Runtime Type and make sure as a part of Hardware Accelerator, GPU has been selected here. So, it's there. Let's move on. Now, in the source code, what we are doing, we are first importing some libraries. Let's take a look. The first library we are importing is OS. Now, OS is for the operating system functionality. Then we are importing TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a library used for faster numerical computation. And finally, we are importing NumPy. NumPy or Numeric Python is a library for array manipulation and is used to convert an array into image. After importing libraries, what we are doing? We are doing in-place augmentation using image data generator for training purpose. So, what is data augmentation here? Data augmentation is basically encompassing a wide range of techniques used to generate new training samples from the original ones by applying random jitters but at the same time ensuring that the class labels of the data are not changed. We are doing in-place data augmentation here as we want to ensure that our network, when it is trained, sees new variations of our data at each and every epoch. Let's now look at the various parameters of image data generator. So, if you look at here, the first parameter is rotation underscore range. Now, this is a value in degrees from 0 to 180. It's a range within which we are randomly rotating the pictures. Next is width shift range, which is a floating point number between 0.0, .0 to 1.0. Now, this specifies the upper bound of the fraction of the total width by which the image is to be randomly shifted, either towards the left or right. Next, we have height shift range. 
This is similar to the earlier parameter width shift range, but is used to control the amount of vertical shift. Then we have zoom range, which is used to specify the image zooming. Next we have horizontal flip that has been set to true to ensure that it is flipping both rows and columns horizontally. After that we have vertical flip that is also has been set to true to flip again both the rows and columns vertically also. Next we have the fill mode which is the strategy that is used for filling in newly created pixels which can appear after a rotation or a width or height shift. Next is C val as you can see here. C val is zero. So we are considering anything outside the boundary. The next parameter is rescale. Rescale is basically a value by which we will multiply the data before any other processing. Let me now run both the sets of code. Next, we are cloning from GitHub. After this, what we are doing? We are mounting the Google Drive where we have uploaded our data set for training. Next, we are unzipping the data set dot zip which contain three folders, training, test and valid. So it has been unzipped. After this, we are defining all the 20 classes, which are by default getting associated to a number in an array. As you can see here, these are my different classes here associated with a number. Now we are preparing for the training test and valid data set by using the function flow from directory. Now this method basically is used to identify classes automatically from the folder. And if we look at the function, so this is the function. Let's now take a look at the parameters of this function. The first parameter is training underscore dir. So this is the directory where my data is located. Then we have the target size, which is the size of input images. So every image will be resized to this size. Then we have the batch size, which is the size of batches of data. Classes is the name of classes. Next is class mode, which I have set up as categorical. Now class mode specifies a number of categories of images. And here categorical means that labels are encoded as categorical vector. Then we have shuffle, which is set to true, which means data has to be shuffled. And finally, we have seed, which is to specify optional random seed for shuffling and transformations. So let me run this code now. So once I run this code, the data has been recognized by the method for all three data sets, that is test, training and valid data set. We can see it here as well. Next, we are going to visualize our data set using matplotlib function, wherein we are putting our class names into a NumPy array and then using matplotlib to display them. Let me just show you now. So, we can see the data type that we have used. This is lightning t-shirt. Like I talked about earlier also, we have taken a different set of data here. Now we are going to download the pre-trained ResNet model, which we are going to use for transfer learning. Let's just do that. Next, we are using the last 15 layer of ResNet model and then fine tuning them by adding our own layer towards the end for image classification on custom data. Let's understand what are the layers we are adding. So if you see here, we are adding global average pooling layer, wherein global average pooling is a pooling operation designed to replace fully connected layers in convolution neural network 
then we are adding a flatten layer to flatten the output of the convolution layer to create a single long feature vector after that we are adding a dense layer which feeds all outputs from the previous layer to all its neurons using relu activation function as you can see here now here each neuron is providing one output to the next layer then we are adding a dropout layer to drop out units both hidden and visible in a neural network so we are dropping 30% of our units here again we are adding a dense layer followed by a dropout layer to further improvise our model in the end we are adding the final dense layer with the softmax activation function for final classification of images and then finally we are printing the model summary for the model we have just defined let me just run this now so we can see here that the model summary of the model has been printed out after this we are going to compile our model by defining loss function optimizer and matrix here we are computing the cross entropy loss as you can see here between the labels and predictions using the cross entropy loss function then we are defining the adam optimizer which is usually used as a default optimizer because of its faster computation time please note that during training of model we tune the parameters and weights to minimize the loss and try to make our prediction accuracy as correct as possible now to change this parameter the optimizer's role come into picture which basically ties the model parameters with the loss function by updating the model in response to the loss function output so here we have used adam optimizer finally we are compiling the model with the accuracy matrix let's just run this while we are working on training a machine learning model we would like to have the ability to monitor the model performance and perform certain actions depending on those performance measures and for that kras callbacks are used these callbacks are designed to be able to monitor the performance in matrix at certain points in the training run and perform some action that might depend on those performance in metric values herein we are using as you can see here reduce lr on plateau callback which reduces the learning rate when a metric has stopped improving models often benefit from reducing the learning rate by a factor of 2 to 10 once the learning stagnates the reduce lr on plateau callback monitors the quantity and if no improvement is seen for a patient number of epochs then the learning rate is reduced in this we are passing the following arguments the first one is the monitor which is the quantity to be monitored then we have patients which is the number of epochs with no improvement after which learning rate will be reduced next is verbose the value of 1 signifies updating messages then we have factor by which the learning rate will be reduced after that we have minimum underscore lr which is the lower bound on the learning rate let's run this now so training is still going on as we can see here it has been some time let's see here how many epochs have been done so 
let's understand what we have done here. We have used model dot fit to start training where it uses all images in your training data. And then we have steps per epoch, which is the total number of samples in your training data set divided by the batch size. Then we are adding all images in validation data and then validation steps is the total number of samples in your training data set divided by the batch size. Epoch is the number times the learning algorithm will work through to the entire training data set and in the end we are adding the previously defined callbacks. At the execution of this function our model training begin. And then the final model is stored in model along with the training history details which are stored in transfer learning history which we are using to plot the model accuracy. So we have seen that the training has been completed. Let's now let's plot the model accuracy and epoch using matplotlib function. So we are going to visualize the accuracy and loss now. Let me just do that. So we can see the model accuracy here. Now next what we are going to do to calculate accuracy we are doing model evaluation with the validation set. And then let's now use this model. So we are doing model prediction with the test data set. So the model which we have trained, now we are using it to do the prediction. So here you can see the prediction of all images in test data. I have just plotted it here. Now, post this, we are going to save our training model in the my underscore model dot h5 file. And also we are saving the classified images name along with the classified classes in the CSV format for further processing. Let's just do that. So with this, we have successfully trained a ResNet based model for image classification. You have already saved the model so you can use it for other projects also as per your project requirement. Let's now take a look at the code download instructions. So, in the resources section of this lecture, you are going to find the source code file that is training reset model for image classification.ipynb file. This is a Jupyter notebook file which you have to download. Along with this, you will also have to download the dataset.zip that contains test training and valid data. To execute the code, you have to open this notebook file which is my training reset model for image classification.ipynb file on Google Colab and you have to run it by selecting runtime of Google Colab as GPU. Welcome back. The focus area of this module is to explain object tracking which is done after the object detection to find the positions of detected objects in each frame of a video. We will first understand the concept of object tracking and also look at the challenges around it. Then we are going to understand single object tracking and multiple object tracking. After that, we will look at the architecture of mean shift algorithm first and then move on to sort framework. After sort, we will understand the architecture of deep sort wherein I will explain how deep sort mitigates the challenges we see in the sort framework. So, let's begin. When we talk about video processing, object tracking is one of the most important areas to understand. On a high level, object tracking is defined as a process of locating the moving objects over time in a video. The goal of object tracking is to locate one or multiple objects of interest in each frame of a video by drawing the smallest rectangle possible, that is, the bounding box in which it can be included. Conceptually, it is a branch within computer vision that involves 
tracking objects as they move across several video frames by using deep learning algorithms. These algorithms in turn merge the knowledge of detecting objects in static images with analysis of temporal information and use it to best predict the trajectories. There are many practical applications of object tracking such as surveillance, traffic flow analysis, people counting, audience flow analysis to name a few. The main purpose of object tracking is to relate target objects in successive video frames. The relation can be specifically tough when the objects are in motion fast relative to the frame rate. Apart from this, another condition that steps up the difficulty of the issue is when the tracked object frequently changes orientation and location over time. To handle this, Various approaches for object tracking have been defined in industry like mean shift, sort and deep sort. But for any algorithm or framework to be successful, it has to handle some common challenges which come in object tracking. Let's understand these challenges. The first challenge that we come across is occlusion. It occurs when an object that is being tracked is hidden by another object. It's more like two people walking past each other or a car entering into a tunnel. The problem in this case is what to do when the object reappears. Second challenge which comes is background clutter. Now background clutter occurs when the background near the object is the same color or texture as the object. As a result, tracking the object in a cluttered background becomes quite difficult. There are two main approaches of object tracking, commonly known as SOT, that is single object tracking, and MOT, that is multiple object tracking. We are now going to spend some time to understand these two approaches. Now, in single object tracking or SOT, we lock in a single object in an image and track it until it exits the frame. For example, if we are tracking the football player, who has the football in a football match, then the player will be tracked until the player exits the frame, which means he no longer has the football. Also, in single object tracking, the object of interest is determined in the first frame, which is where the object to be tracked is initialized for the first time. The tracker is then tasked with locating that unique target in all other given frames. SOT or single object tracking implementation is relatively easier as we don't have to handle the problem of distinguishing the object from others. Let's now jump to multiple object tracking or MOT. In multiple object tracking, there are multiple objects to track. So, we first determine the number of objects and then we log on to every object in the frame. Thus, uniquely identifying each one of them and then track all of them until they exit the frame. So implementing multiple object tracking or MOT is more challenging as not only you have to determine the number of objects which typically varies over time but you also have to maintain their identities. In addition to this, MOT becomes complicated also because of frequent occasions. Here in Occlusion refers to the scenario which often occurs when two or more objects come too close and seemingly merge or combine with each other. So, a multiple object tracking algorithm should decide whether a new track appears and an existing track vanishes. Mean shift algorithm is defined as an algorithm that iteratively shifts a data point to the average of data points in its neighborhood. It's a non-parametric clustering algorithm that does not need prior information of the number of clusters and also does not constrain the shape of the clusters. From an architecture perspective, the following steps are iterated in order to track the object by using mean shift algorithm. The first step is we select a search window size and the initial position of the search window. Then we estimate the mean position in the search window. After that, 
we centered the search window at the mean position estimated in the earlier step and finally we repeat the last two steps until the mean position moves less than a preset threshold that is until the convergence is achieved let's now understand this through an example if you look at the figure on the screen we can see that the initial window is shown in blue circle with the name c1 its original center is marked in blue rectangle named as c1 underscore o but if you find the centroid of the points inside that window you will get the point c1 underscore r which is marked in small blue circle which is the real centroid of the window so we can see that they don't match and if we move the window such that the circle of the new window matches with the previous centroid again we try to find the new centroid and it won't match so we move it again and we are going to continue these iterations such that the center of the window and its centroid falls on the same location or within a very small desired error so finally what we are going to obtain we will obtain a window with maximum pixel distribution which is marked in the figure with a green circle named as c2 as you can see in the image this has the maximum number of points now from a mathematical perspective if we consider a set of n data points in a d dimensional euclidean space x where in kx denotes a kernel function that indicates how much x contributes to the estimation of the mean now the sample mean m at x with kernel k is given by the formula which you can see on the screen and thus we can obtain the difference between mx and x which is what we call the mean shift there are many frameworks available in the industry for object tracking the most commonly used framework is simple real time tracker also called as sort framework which is a real time tracking framework for multiple object tracking if you look at the diagram on the screen you can see that from an architecture perspective it comprises of four main components detection estimation association and track identity creation and destruction let's now understand each of these steps first comes detection sort works on the principle of tracking by detection and is based on rudimentary data association and state estimation techniques and is designed for online tracking applications wherein only past and current frames are available and the method produces object identities on the fly next is estimation sort uses kalman filter for estimation what is a kalman filter well kalman filter is an algorithm that uses a series of measurements observed over time and produces estimates of unknown variables so sort uses kalman filter to predict future positions based on the current position for example if a is detected within frame t and b is detected within frame t plus 1 and a and b are associated as the same object using some criteria say iou or intersection over union then kalman filter can use b's location in the frame t plus 1 as a new measurement for a to update the states now post estimation sort uses the hungarian algorithm for association which helps to determine if an object in current frame is the same as the one in the previous frame now the last one is track identity sort tracks each detection by assigning unique id to each bounding box as soon as an object is lost due to occlusion or wrong identification then tracker assigns a new id and start tracking the new found object from a performance perspective sort achieves best in class performance with respect to both speed and accuracy but one challenge is that sometimes wrong identification can happen due to occlusion sort achieves a good performance in terms of tracking precision and accuracy 
as object detection is being done by assigning a unique ID to each bounding box. But there is one small challenge with sort framework. In some cases, wrong identification can happen due to occlusion, that is, when two objects become too close and it seems as if they have merged or combined with each other. In this case, object tracking can wrongly track the object. To handle this came deep sort framework. Now, deep sort is an extension to sort with a deep association metric that has been added to improve the performance of sort. Due to this extension, we are able to track objects through longer periods of occlusions thus effectively reducing the number of identity switches. If we look at the architecture diagram of deep sort on the screen, then we can see that first of all an input video is divided into different frames which are then sent to object detector to detect the objects. The object detector then uses the YOLO algorithm for object detection and after that track estimator that is the original component of the sort algorithm uses the Kalman filter to predict the location of the object bounding boxes. The prediction is based on previous object velocities. So what is a track estimator? The track estimator is the location metric that uses intersection over union or IOU distance between the detected bounding box and the predicted bounding box. After this, the appearance information is extracted using CNN so that the features from one object class are similar and the features from different object classes are different in the feature space. This appearance descriptor is actually the appearance metric. Post that, data association assigns the detected bounding boxes to the existing track of an object using the location metric and the appearance metric. After that, track handling controls the object track. If a new detected bounding box can't be associated with any track at a frame F, for example, it will be put into a tentative track. The deep sort will then try to associate the tentative track with the other track in subsequent frames. In case the association is successful, then the track would be updated. Otherwise, this tentative track would be removed. Also, the squared Melanobis distance is used as a distance metric as it is an effective metric when dealing with distributions. So it is used for measurement to track association that is for determining the relation between a measurement and an existing track. So this is how deep sort works. If we look at the performance, then deep sort algorithm reduces the number of identity switches by almost 45% and gives a very high frame per second that is FPS. So we can say that deep sort is very effective but it does have some limitations. First of all, if the bounding boxes are too big then too much of background is captured in the features thus reducing the effectiveness of the algorithm. The second challenge is that if people are dressed similarly as usually happens in sports then that can result in similar features and ID switching which has to be handled. Welcome to the project Tracking Football Players Using Object Tracking. In this project, we are going to learn how can we track football players in a football match using sort framework and YOLO algorithm. So I am going to start with project overview session where I am going to explain the high level design of the project. Then I am going to move on to code walkthrough where I am going to explain you the source code of this project along with instructions on how to execute the code. And finally, I am going to provide you with the code download instructions so that you can run the project and practice yourself. Welcome to the project overview session for the project tracking football players using object tracking. Now, in this project, we are tracking the players in a football match video where we are providing a unique number to a player and in the consecutive video, we are tracking that player with that unique number. For this, we are using sort framework for tracking and YOLO for object detection. We have gone through these concepts before, but just to reiterate, sort is a framework that works on the principle of tracking by detection and works 
by assigning a unique ID to each bounding box. So we are using sort for tracking and then YOLO is an algorithm that uses neural networks to provide real-time object detection. So we are using YOLO for the object detection. Now in the project, I have used a pre-trained YOLO model using the Darknet framework that has been trained with thousands of images from Coco dataset. I am going to give you a code walkthrough on the project using PyCharm. So let's now move to the code walkthrough session. I am now going to give you the code walkthrough for the project tracking football players using object tracking. So I have opened the project in the PyCharm and as a first step we have to configure the Python interpreter for the project. Now for that you have to go to the file menu. Go to settings and then in this you will see this python interpreter and you will see a drop down here. Click on this drop down, select show all and here you have to add a new virtual environment for the project. To do so click on this plus icon and we can see it's creating an environment for us. So the name here is VENV which I have given. You can give any name of your choice and just click on OK. So this is going to create the virtual environment for you. So we can see here that the new environment has been created. Just click on OK. So this environment has come with the default pip and setup packages. Just click on OK here. Now the next step is to install the requirements. So there are certain packages that you need to have to execute the project. So that's something we have to install. If you see the pop-up is coming for install requirements at the top. So just click on install requirements here. So these are all the packages with their versions. Just click on install and all these packages would be installed for you. In certain scenarios, it might happen that your requirements.txt file failed to install and start giving you some errors. Now, to resolve this, you have to go to requirements.txt file. Just open it here. Within this, you can see all the packages along with their versions which you have to install. So now we are going to open terminal within PyCharm and write there pip install. And then copy the name of package and paste it here. Let me just show you. So I have pasted the package name here and I am going to execute this command by pressing enter. Once I have done this, my filter py package would be installed. Similarly, repeat the same command pip install for all these packages. Just copy and paste the packages in the terminal and execute these commands. This will make sure all your packages are properly installed. We will now move back to the source code. At the start of the code, I have imported the package cv2, which is a library that comes with various functions for image processing and computer vision tasks. Along with this, we are also importing the functions from sort.py and then I am creating an object by the name tracker for the sort class and also creating some variables. 
like memory, line and counter. Next we are going to load the COCO class labels which contain the complete set of classes on which our YOLO model was trained and after that we are going to initialize a list of colors to represent each possible class label. After this we are going to define the path to the YOLO weights and model configuration. The weights and model configuration is available with the code in the resources section. After this, we are going to load our YOLO object detector trained on COCO data set that has 80 classes and determine only the output layer names that we need from YOLO. Next, we are going to initialize the video stream, pointer to output video file and specify the frame dimensions. For the demo purpose, we are running the code on the recorded video, but it can be executed on the edge also. Now we are going to loop over the frames from the video stream and process them frame by frame. During processing, if the frame is not grabbed, then we have reached the end of the stream. And if the frame dimensions are empty, as you can see here, then we will grab them. After this, we are constructing a blob from the input frame and then performing a forward pass of the YOLO object detector, which is going to give us our bounding boxes and associated probabilities. Then we are going to initialize our list of detected bounding boxes, confidence and class IDs. After this, we are going to loop over each of the layer outputs and loop over each of the detections and extract the class ID and the confidence that is the probability of the current object detection. We will then filter out weak predictions by ensuring the detected confidence score is greater than the minimum probability. We will scale the bounding box coordinates back relative to the size of the image, keeping in mind that YOLO actually returns the center, that is the X and Y coordinates of the bounding box, followed by the boxes width and height. We are then going to use the center X, Y coordinates to derive the top and the left corner of the bounding box. And then we are going to update our list of bounding box coordinates. And along with that, we'll also update the confidence and class ID. We are then going to apply the non-maxima suppression to suppress the weak overlapping bounding boxes. We are then looping over the indexes we are keeping and identifying the boxes with confidence score and storing it in a depth array, as you can see here, and then converting it into an array format. Now we are calling the update function of sort class using tracker object and passing these bounding boxes. Just for your reference, here in depths is a numpy array of detections in the format of x, y width height of the bounding box. This method must be called once for each frame, even with empty detections. It returns a similar array where the last column is the object id. The number of objects returned may differ from the number of detections provided. Now I am initializing some more variables here and then in the for loop what we are doing, we are extracting the bounding box values returned by a sort function and appending it into another array boxes and we are also storing the unique ID of the object into a separate array by the name index IDs. Now we have created a dictionary to map the reference of index ID with the corresponding bounding box array. We are then using if condition to check the length of boxes to validate non-empty values and then initializing few integer counters as well. We are then starting a for loop here over each array with values of bounding boxes for multi-object detection and post that we are extracting the x, y, width and height values. Now we are drawing a bounding box rectangle and label on the image. Post this, we are creating a text for each bounding box with its class name and its unique object ID and then placing this text on top of bounding box and finally we will validate and count the class ID against the class and then continue looping over other objects in the frame and mark them. Now we write the total count of object present in this frame on image based on previous calculation and finally 
the modified frame is added to the main writer object for saving to generate the final video. The IM show displays a video while the code is getting executed. If you want to quit while the execution is going on, you can simply press the letter Q to quit. And in the end, we are releasing the objects and closing the live video. Let me just run this code now. So we can see here, this is a recorded video of a football match. It's displaying the total count of football players here. This count is varying. So depending upon how many football players are there in a specific frame, this count is getting updated. So with this, we have learned how to do the football players tracking using object tracking. Let's now take a look at the code download instruction. The code base contains object tracking .zip, which you can download from the resources section. After extraction of this folder, you will get python file main.py, which is the main source file, and also sort.py, which is a file based on sort framework. You will also get the input video file, and also within YOLO obj, you will find the YOLO v3 config file, coco names, and YOLO3 object names file. There is also a requirements.txt file which contains the required version of packages for running the code. I have already provided you the pre-trained weights in this project, but if you want to train yourself, then you can download and use the YOLO v3 weights from the resources section. So this brings us to the end of this project.